What are we missing the staff? I think we're pretty much here. I see is the commission members back at. I uh, don't there's Patrick. I'm here. Yeah. Yes, I'm ready to go whenever you guys are. Okay, we're all ready. Um, <clears throat> are we on the air? <laughs> yes, yes, we are. Okay, I'd like to bring to order the Malibu Planning Commission regular meeting uh, session dated Monday, November 16th, 2020. May we have a roll call, please? Commissioner Jennings? Here. Commissioner Uring? Here. Commissioner Weil? Here. Vice Chair Marks? Here. Chair Maza? Here. You have a quorum. Thank you. Um, we'd like to call to order the Planning Commission meetings uh, today. We've already done that. This meeting will be held by teleconference due to COVID-19 pandemic. And we appreciate everyone's patience as we navigate this Zoom meeting process. Planning commissioners and city staff are participating from remote locations and all votes will be taken by roll call. Members of the public can participate in the meeting or watch it by going to malibucity.org slash forward slash virtual meeting. At this screen, you can click on the tab to either just watch the meeting or sign up to speak on a particular item. You will only be able to speak during the meeting if you follow the instructions on the screen to sign up for to, uh, with the to speak tab. Once the item is called, no further speakers signups will be allowed. Please make sure you <clears throat> visit malibucity.org forward slash for virtual meeting early to download the Zoom application and sign up to speak. The recording secretary will call on those who have signed up to speak when the item is called. You must also be present in the Zoom meeting to be recognized. The applicant team for uh, public hearings will be have a total of 15 minutes to speak, including any rebuttal time. Members of the public will be afforded three minutes only. No additional time will be donated to another speaker. Commissioners, if you have comments, you may, you may make comments to make during the meeting, please raise your hand and I will call on you in turn so we can make this, our discussions clear for the record and the public. Okay. Um, Steve, since you're a short timer, can you do the Pledge of Allegiance? Can you hear me? You're on mute, you're on, you're on mute Steve. All right, I'll, I'll stand up. Ready? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, United States, States of America, America. America and to the Republic, the Republic for which it stands, stands one, nation, one nation under God, under God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, liberty and, justice and justice for all. all. Thank you very much. You did good. Okay, may we have a motion to um, a motion to approve the agenda. I will make that motion uh, and uh, uh, move to approve the agenda as recommended by staff with item 4A continued to December 7th, item 4B continued to December 7th, item 5A continued to December 7th, and that's it. I'll we second. Here, I'll second. Martha, if I may interrupt for a moment. Yes. Um, we interrupt. <laughs> thank you. We um, have received uh, a call from the applicant on the project uh, 5C, the uh, Cusford Road project, I believe it is. And they had asked if we would continue that for the next hearing so that they could have their attorney address the question about the deed restrictions that are on the property. And what date did you have, Richard? Uh, you're on mute. mute again. There you go. There we go. Hopefully that stays off. <laughs> um, December 7th. Okay. Uh, Jeff, you accept that? That's my motion. I'll the great second. Okay. Uh, may we have a roll call, please? Commissioner Jennings? Yes. Vice Chair Marks? Yes. Commissioner Uring? Yes. Commissioner Weil? Yes. 
Chair Mazza? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, may we have a uh, report on posting of the agenda, please? The agenda for this meeting was properly posted on November 5th. 2020 with the amended agenda posted on November 6th, 2020. Okie dokie. Um, do we have any uh, written or uh, oral communications with the public? I hear an echo, but... Um, yeah, there's some, there's some noise in the background there. And yeah. it, it, it isn't me, but um, it's someone. So I don't see any speakers for uh, 2A at no one has signed up. Okay. Do we have any commission comments? Well, I did, I would like to dedicate. <laughs> I'd like to dedicate the meeting to uh, Kim Tipper, who is a uh, seventy-year resident of Malibu who passed away. And I don't know if anybody, if you know him, but he virtually graded every lot in Malibu for sixty years, and knew more about Malibu than. Anybody I know. So I'd like to uh, dedicate the meeting to him if the uh, commission approves. Other than that, I have no comments. John? Yes. John? Yes. You're, you're right. Very quick right. one. Uh, and I just, Richard, I understand that you guys have been working on some of these gas stations, getting them dark sky compliant, uh, which is really good news. You've got what, three of them signed up now or four? We have a total of five applications off the top of my head. One has been approved. The other four we issued corrections on. Cool. Thank you very much. It's a big, gas stations were one of the big offenders we were trying to get under control. So thank you very much for that effort. Oh, no problem. And just to let you know, uh, we are also working with code enforcement uh, so that, you know, we're trying to make it so it's only one round of corrections because it would be nice to get it done. Yes, I agree. Thank you. Okay. I also uh, had another comment, uh, Richard. Uh, our city calendar states that we have a second meeting in December. I assume that's an error. Is that correct? Uh, that is my understanding. Yes, that meeting was going to be dark uh, the, as standard because of close to the holidays. Plus, we typically do that. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah. So no. No, I will. Oh yes, David. I was just going to congratulate Steve on his election victory and. Uh, it won't be the same without you. David, thank you very much. I'm just hoping that Jeff isn't holding on to a bunch of uncounted ballots that are going to throw me out at the very end. So, yeah, let's <laughs> wait until the result is certified. <laughs> what's, what's in that box over Jeff's shoulder? I'm not sure. <laughs> thank well, you, David. I appreciate it. They're thank chapter you. at the county, and I give the same sentiments to you, Steve. You'll be great. Ditto. Yeah, absolutely. It won't be the same without him. <laughs> I had to think long and hard about those remarks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, it's, good. it's good to have friends. <laughs> okay. Uh, Richard, do you have any comments? Uh, no, I don't have anything at this time. Okay, so we're off to the consent calendar. Do we have anything uh, to be pulled? John? Yeah, I'm going to pull 3B1. Anybody else? I'll be I'll pull 2 and 3. Okay. Okay, let's start with 3B1 then. We only have 3, right? Yeah. You can count them. Okay. Yeah. Uh, on the minutes, we don't need a report. We just need a correction. If you'll go to, and Richard can answer this, um, on page... Five of nine of the November 2nd meeting on the motion, part two, which is uh, on the bottom part of the paragraph. Uh, it says specifying all landscaping within the front yard setback must be maintained at a maximum height of 42 inches measured from each side of the landscaping. I believe that should be corrected to uh, correct me if I'm wrong, natural grade. You had said the street side of the landscaping uh, in, the, in the comments. Yeah, and I don't, is that what we said when we made the motion? Because 
the street side is kind of a, a weird description, but um, that's my recollection. Yeah, we wanted to measure from the street side, John. I thought what we said is, is it, what we put it finally came down to after a lot of conversation was measured from both sides. Right. I'm proud with that. As long as we're, yeah. we're getting both sides. Okay, and uh, I'm going to have our attorney uh, uh, correct all this once we get done if we screw something up. Okay, and then the next sentence says specifying that no all retaining walls, so eliminate the word no. Right, because you have a double negative there. Okay. And uh, and on the next one, um, you wanted to take the word fences out because we don't want fences and walls uh, to ex to go to 12 feet. We only want uh, a, a combination of retaining walls to be 12 feet. So it's my understanding on that project, there are no 12-foot retaining walls. No, no, there aren't. Uh, so shouldn't we just eliminate that last half of the sentence? That's fine. We can do that. Okay. Um, does anybody else remember anything else? Well, just to be clear, John, is there any change then after the maximum height of 42 inch inches? Are we okay to keep it exactly as written? Uh, 12 feet, uh, uh, 6 feet. Sorry, no, just um, the, the one where it says as measured from either side of the landscaping, do we agree that's going to stay the same then? It sounds like that we what we recall collectively. I believe so. Yeah, I have a problem with that. Okay. Wasn't it from either side of the, of the fence? Wasn't that what we were talking about? Not either side of the landscaping? Yeah, it's either side of the wall or the fence, yes. That's the way I remember it. And by yeah. the way, uh, Richard is... These are the minutes, and there's also a resolution, and the resolution is basically what counts. Are we correcting the resolution at the same time as we correct the minutes, or is the, has the resolution already been signed and sealed and delivered with the original language in it, or what? We I double checked the resolution, and it does reflect accurately these this double negative stuff and how we're measuring things. I was able to find that, and the resolution is correct. It was in uh, okay. the minutes that we had the error. Okay. So what about the uh, the retaining walls in that that last sentence? Um, it is correct in the resolution. The resolution talks about a combination of walls, not fences. Okay. So, well, exactly. But we have no wall. So if we if we eliminate the the wall part of it, are we correct? I, I would recommend that we we. Uh, I think you can strike that out of the, the minutes because you don't have anything that's that tall. Nothing exceeds six feet on that particular property. Okay. Um, I make a motion to approve it the way we have corrected it. I'll second it. And just to be clear then, the only change is going to be the removal of the word no. Is that right? No. Uh, We're changing the, separate error. We're changing the retaining walls. And we're yeah. changing the word landscaping. Right. There are th uh, three modifications. There's the measurement one that was discussed first. The second modification was to remove the word no, uh, because it says no retaining walls. It's a double negative in that sentence. We need to get rid of that no. And then the third was to remove the combination of walls, since there were no combination of walls. So that's my motion. And I'll second. Okay. Maybe we have a roll call, please. Chair Mazza? Yes. Commissioner Uring? Yes. Commissioner Weil? Yes. Commissioner Jennings? Yes. Vice Chair Marks? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. Um, we're off to 3B2. 3B2. Well, right. Steve, would you like a staff report? Uh, no, I just, the reason I pulled this is, and just John Mazza and I visited this property, when was it, Saturday? I think last Saturday, and took a look. And I didn't have real major problems with the, the project, but when I w looked at the plans, the, 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 I, I couldn't. There were parts of the plans that didn't seem to be complete. For example, this there's a, a was an accessory dwelling unit on the property. 
there was 900 and some odd square feet. When look at, and it was going to be reduced. But when I looked at the plans, I couldn't see how, where that reduction, how that reduction was reflected in the plans we got. And then later this afternoon, around about three o'clock something, I got an email from the applicant with some other plans talking about, uh, either decks or, or overhangs which apparently was not in the original plans. And then I talked to Richard and he said, we're going to get another set of documents from the city. So I'm just wondering where the hell we are with the plans. Do they reflect, are they, do they reflect what is in the, the resolution or not, or what's going on? Well, before you answer that, uh, I also want to say that I checked the plans and the guest house is being approved at 990 square feet instead of 900 since we're approving those plans. And I did not receive any new plans at all. So uh, I, I, I think personally that we need to continue this item until, uh, until we, the, the plans we're approving match the resolutions we're approving. So Richard, could you comment on that? Certainly, I am, Jessica is available and she's going to explain some of that. Uh, because yes, um, we, we've got an answer for you on the overhangs. And then the other issue was that accessory structure is 990 square feet, and it's only going to be approved to be 900 square feet habitable. Uh, there's a room they're going to section off that will only be ex uh, attainable or uh, enter, you can only enter it from the outside. So that we are consistent with the city's codes, but let me let Jessica speak uh, as she's been working on that, and then also Jessica will um, explain the other issue we found was um, the slope analysis really didn't match the field condition when staff looked at site photos and also visited the site. And yes, um, I, I do agree. A clean set of plans would be good. We're just trying uh, in an effort to get a fire rebuild going, and that's why we're here. Um, so to elaborate a little bit more on what Richard has mentioned, um, in regards to, we'll start at separate issues, the first being the overhangs, that should be consistent on the plans that you received, both included in the staff report as and as well in your 11 by 17 plans that you've received. Um, there was adjustments previously made um, to show the overhangs as being open to the sky in order to be compliant with the total development square footage for the property. So that's the first issue. The second being, as Richard mentioned, the guest house does show on the plans is 990 square feet. Um, however, conditioned in the resolution is conditioned at, to be only 900 square feet. They are sectioning off a portion of the guest house to um, be used as storage with only exterior access. And that would be 90 square feet of that. Um, you are correct though, that is not shown on the plan, but that is conditioned within the resolution. And then finally, what we discovered at the color-coded slope analysis um, was showing construction of the single family residence on steep slopes. However, the field conditions are flat as there was also a previously approved greenhouse that was located on that flat pad and the field conditions as observed by staff, as well as story poll photos that we have on file show it to be a flat pad where the single family residence is being constructed. Okay, so here's the question. So what are we approving? When we do this stuff, are we approving the set of plans? Are we only approving the resolution? Yes. What? Yes, what? Yes, we are. We don't approve plans. We, the, the plans have to go through plan check. After you get done with going through planning and getting our approval, then you go into plan check, which are all kinds of adjustments are made to make sure that you comply with code. And those are the plans that get stamped. But we, my understanding is, we we approve the resolution. What we say in the resolution, the resolution makes reference in various places to the final plans. Will say this, and the final plans right. must say that. Yeah. Well, typically there's there's a statement in, in the staff report that says this is based upon a set of plans that were received and on file as of a certain date. And that's not what we have today. But, no, and I, that's a different question. I, I I think the purpose of giving us plans is so we can help to understand the nature of the project and what it looks like to make sure that it complies with the LIP and the code. But I don't think that we are, when we say 
yes or no. We're saying yes or no to a specific set of plans. But this is a question for Richard to answer, not me. Well, before you get to Richard, I have a question on that. Uh, the planning department determines footprints and heights, et cetera. The permit department does the detail. But they're not allowed to change what we approve. And if we approve the wrong set of plans, they can't change them. Okay, so uh, unless the planning director comes back and does a non-substantial change, et cetera, et cetera. So I have a real problem with not noticing the public on the actual, the actual building, what it really is and what the slopes really are. And uh, I, I have never seen us approve a, a, a faulty set of plans in a resolution. Uh, not that we're trying to stop a rebuild. And by the way, this is this a fire rebuild is a question. Uh, it, because it's before us, it, it shouldn't be. And um, I guess I'll ask our attorney, shouldn't we follow the process? And what is the delay? Uh, could this be continued to the next meeting and then and then we've already gone over it and we know what the changes should be? So I, I, I apologize, I, I didn't quite follow that, that, that question. So if we continue it, will, will they still, I guess, qualify for a, for a fire rebuild? Is that the question? No, no, the question is, does this cost two weeks or six months? I mean, it should only cost two weeks of time. Uh, we're basically not objecting to the a lot to this house. We haven't voted on it, obviously, but we have a set of plans that do not represent what we're approving. And the public has never been notified of that until this very well, second. Well, Chris, and, and Richard, you, you can uh, interrupt me if I'm wrong here. What's there's before before us right now is, is just the approval of the planning director's report on the on the administrative CDP. So, 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 so I, I understand everyone's concerns, but hey, we're, we're not really fully understanding the project. That's that's well taken. But my understanding is there is no formal resolution passed tonight. There's no, you know, nothing like that. Um, and as for the two weeks to the to, to the six months question, I, I mean, I, I'm not really sure I can answer that. Richard, would, would you know? Is this would that be more of a of an applicant thing? How, how much longer they have, or can you speak to that? Certainly. So uh, one thing I'd like to say is that uh, the owner. Uh, Gary Murphy is available to speak, and I think he'd like to speak too. Um, but um, the 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 notice reflects a 900 square foot house, and also the conditions of approval reflect a 900 square foot house. So uh, even if the plans had a 2,000 square foot accessory dwelling unit or second unit, um, the fact is that the approval is only for 900 square feet. So. I don't disagree that there are some um, inaccuracies in the plans in that respect, uh, but uh, you know the options here. Of, and, uh, Pat, you may have to help me with this. Is yeah. either the um, the applicant could say yes, I'd like to continue it for to the next meeting to give us some revised drawings, or, or the commission could pull it. I don't know if I have the authority. This is where Pat may have to come in. To, to put the brakes on this for two weeks at this point. I, I think it would have to be either the applicant uh, or the commission uh, pulling the item. Is that correct, Pat? Correct, that's my understanding. While, while everyone's speaking right now, I will of course double check that. But yeah, the, the only real options here are, you know, from at least from the planning commission side is once again, if the applicant would like to, they can they can continue it or the planning commission can pull it for kind of a, a, a a full, you know, regular CDP application. Can I ask you a question on that? Um, if we pull it, they have to go through a CDP hearing. If we continue it, they just have to come back with right. plans. Is that right? We don't. I, I think the argument is that we don't have the power to continue it. We either have to say we're pulling it, come back for a CDP, or we let it go as a receiving file. Or if the, if the applicant says I'm willing to continue, can, yes. he can do that. Yes, and, exactly. and look, I, I don't have a problem with this house. I mean, I, we looked at the house. Again. I'm just trying to make sure that all the pieces are in place and we're doing it correctly. I mean, if, if we've got those issues with the plans, are there more issues with? I I don't know. So I, I would like to see a good set of plans go with the house 
and get it approved, let them get it built. I got no problem with any of that. I have a, a couple more questions on the plans. Um, for example, there's pl- several places in the plans that show somebody standing on a deck on the second floor, and I don't see any analysis of overhangs. So, and there's a patio below it. Um, you know, there's just something that there's there's some holes in these plans. Uh, I don't want to tell the applicant what to do. I just want to make sure the applicant understands if we pull it, it's a full hearing. And correct me if I'm wrong. If we pull it, it's a full hearing. If we accept it, in my opinion, it's the first time in my history on the Planning Commission, we accepted a faulty um, public notice and or uh, whatever you want to call it. And uh, if he goes for a continuance, it's merely a matter of correcting the plans and coming back for a, a, a consent by the Planning Commission. The three choices. Chris Mars got his hand up, John. Okay, I don't know why I can't see him, but I can go. Yeah. Speak, Chris. Just a quick one. Um, this is to Richard. Just uh, from your perspective and timing, would you see any difference in having the regular hearing or having this come back on a continuance? That's the first question I'd have. Would there be any difference from your perspective in the amount of time? Because I just see it safer for this applicant if they just have a full CDP in front of us, then there's no way it's going to get pulled again. Um, but I just want to check with you if there's any any delay from something like that. The one thing is if the owner uh, would like to correct the plans just to prevent this from uh, changing, uh, the one advantage is that we could, uh, I I believe, the noticing deadlines. I'm just worried that where we are, if we don't make the December 7th meeting, then that would trigger this thing going to a meeting in uh, January because we're not going to have that second meeting. Can you get the plans corrected by December 7th? Uh, we we should ask Gary. Uh, okay, uh, I'm gonna uh, rather than open the hearing, I'm gonna have uh, uh, staff ask Gary, or we could open it for a public. Well, I think it's better. You better Let's have open the thought. public hearing and and uh, have him uh, make his comments. What disclosures? Yeah, disclosures. Okay, Jeff. I uh, went by the property, took a look at it to see what I could see in terms of the view. That's all. David? I uh, walked the property with uh, Gary and discussed uh, basically no issues that are not already in the uh, plan. The report, sorry. Chris? Uh, Visited the property, didn't learn anything beyond what's on the staff report. Steve? Yeah, John Mazza and I visited the property, walked it with Gary, and that's where some of these questions regarding the size of the accessory dwelling unit didn't tie in. So I mean, I again, I I didn't have any major problems with the project. It's just I couldn't see the plans reflecting everything that was in the resolution. And I had the same experience. Uh, I actually learned about the size of the guest house from the applicant. Okay. Uh, and it was interesting when we were there. John made we we looked at the slope analysis, and it looked like it was wrong because it you know it didn't it, it there was a Slope wasn't there, so I just want to make sure the plans are right. I'm just, you know, I got no problem with the house. Just let's not screw anything up for somebody else. I see that uh, the uh, the owner Daphne Murphy is in our meeting, and um, I think it would be appropriate. We could just ask her if she would be willing to delay this by two weeks, and then we can uh, bring you a revised notice of decision. And by the way, before we open it up to her. Uh, that would be a consent item, so it would not be put at the end of the agenda. That's correct. It would be heard for sure. Okay, cool. Okay, uh, uh, Daphne, can somebody open up Daphne and uh, let her speak? Unmute her. There we go. You're on, Daphne. Okay, hi, hi it's <laughs> Daphne and Gary. Um, We're um, both on. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, so I the plans that Jessica has show the. Uh, we had to reduce the um, the overhangs, and those are the plans that we submitted some time ago that everyone should have a copy of. Those plans are correct, right, Richard? 
Well, my understanding from staff is yes, that's correct. Um, I think the concern here from the commission is that one, we get the slope analysis corrected so it doesn't show uh, construction on a steep slope. And okay. then also, I think it was uh, sheet A3.00 uh, show the final floor plan of the second unit so that it's only 900 square feet instead of the 990, I think it is. Okay, so we need to draw in how we're reducing that by the 90 feet. That's correct. Okay, and the slope analysis, um, uh, John, Steve, you were out there. What we realized is that when the engineer was, or the geologist was out there, they did a slope analysis, what I looked at, how it was drawn, when the excavator tore out the foundation of the greenhouse, there was a like three foot long hole there. Right. Now that has filled in over the last two years, but she, that's what she's drawn in showing a um a slope that doesn't exist anymore so yeah, we try to it. so we try to, yeah i understand it just so make a comment on that uh you get your whoever did your slope analysis to get mm -hmm. an eraser okay all righty i hope she can get to it. she's been well but, but no we'll yeah we'll get her out there so yes we would prefer it to be continuous i guess so um to get on the next meeting um, instead of. With the understanding that we have to have the, the 990 drawn in showing 900 and a Correct. geologist to get rid of that blue where the house is going on the slope analysis. Yeah, no, that's a, you know, Richard can tell you the details on how you do that. I don't know. Okay. Um, it should be fairly simple. Okay, well, thank you. Do you have anything else to say? Just again, thanks for working with us. Okay, <laughs> we're trying to do it. We're trying to. We're, we're not going to open the bottle of champagne tonight. Yeah. Okay, well, we're trying not to ruin your night. We're just trying to get it right. Okay, let's close the public hearing. Uh, do we have a motion? I may have a question, John. Sure. I guess for Richard. Richard is it, or, or Patrick? Is it not possible for us to approve this subject to those two changes being made on the plans, so that we would be approving? The, I, I, plans that would reflect uh, 900, not 990, and the correct slope analysis. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't have any any issue with that because you know, once again, this is this is the, the 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 action here is is receive and file. So if it was a receive and file that the, the plan directors report pursuant to the you know the, the changes that Commissioner Wheel just articulated, I would have no problem with that, Richard. Um, big question on that. So go ahead, Richard. I think John and I were about to say the same thing. So, you know, since this is a reporting item and not a public hearing, yeah. uh, I can't add any conditions or tweak conditions of the notice of decision uh, without reissuing it. Because, yes, I would, I, I do wish there was a way, because this is a simple fix. I do wish there was a way we could just do this, um, but I, I can't alter those conditions of approval uh, since I issued it and noticed it as such. That's what I thought you were going to say. So uh, just <laughs> sorry. To... Okay, I think we got a path to get this approved in the next meeting. So do we need a motion to do that, or how do we do yeah, that? You need to make a motion to continue. I'll make I a motion to continue. I think we probably ought to do it is to say that the. Uh, Applicant has come forward and requested that this item be continued and, and, and let it go as a as an amendment to our approval of the agenda because we're really continuing matters like this is not really one of our options. We either have to receive and file or we have to pull it and have it come back for a full CDP. So my suggestion would just be we take it as an amendment to the agenda. And uh, okay, I'll make a motion to amend the agenda to include item 5C to continue to December 7th, 2020. 3B2 we're talking 3B2. about. 3B2. Oh, I'm sorry, 3B2. No, I'm getting I'll second that. Is, that. is that what you were talking about, Jeff? Yeah. Does that work? Yes. Okay, I'll second that. Okay, may we have a roll call, please? Chair Mazza? Yes. Commissioner Uring? Yes. Commissioner Jennings? Yes. Commissioner Wild? Yes. Vice Chair Marks? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, good. Uh, you might as well do things right. Um, okay, and okay, we're now on to formula retail clearance. Uh, 3B3. 
3B3, uh, formula retail clearance number 20-003, the park at Cross Creek Shopping Center, 23401 Civic Center Way. Okay, John? Yeah, I have. Uh, I pulled this. Okay. And you just uh, just a real quick one. When I looked through the permitted uses, I did not see a car dealership available there. And there are a whole bunch of statements in the staff report regarding, you know, cars not parked on site and other stuff, that there are no rules any place to say they got to do that. I'm just I'm just not sure how this how the actual process is going to be reflected based upon the fact that there's nothing in writing that says they got to do anything. Yeah, I had the, the same concerns and I'm going to read off the uses that are allowed um, in a second, but uh, and I was, we're going to, I'm going to do disclosures. Uh, can we have disclosures? Anybody? I got none. Um, Visited this site, nothing, nothing new. David? Yeah. Visited the site. Okay. That's it. Uh, I had a discussion with Richard about uh, the propriety of doing this. Um, and I also had a discussion with Trevor uh, about this. Uh, and it's a process question. And that is, as I understand it, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, this is merely a report to us on whether it's exempt from retail ordinance prohibitions. But uh, not, nowhere does it state whether it's a legal use or not, which makes a question of whether the planning department can allow a, a, a use not approved in the LIP without a amendment to the LIP or a variance if allowed or a CUP if allowed. Uh, also, Steve brought up the other problem and that is apparently the planning department considers that they have given some limitations on this use, namely, and this I got only verbally, uh, namely that they can't park demo cars there. Um, but there's no provision in the retail ordinance code to put any of these provisions, restrictions on this use. So it's my opinion, and I'd like to ask the city attorney, we, we can't approve a non-permitted use to be calculated under the retail formula uh, calculation and without because we have no ability to memorialize anything at all about the use of that property under this under this uh, it's only a report to us it has nothing to do with um, any kind of binding uh, permit or anything else. And so I'd just like to read, just so we get the understanding of what's allowed in the CC zone. And that's bookstores, food markets, hardware and garden supplies, liquor store, no, not liquor store, plant nurseries, prescription pharmacies, uh, stationary supplies, bakeries, barbershops, laundries, um, miscellaneous uses such as food, photocopy services, photographic processing and supplies, mailing services and appliance repairs, banks and financial institutions, medical and dental physical therapy, professional offices, dance studios, health clubs, and public beach uh, access ways. Um, so I think we have a catch-22 that's a problem and we need to have uh, staff come back and figure out uh, how to rectify it. So I would like to say. And so, and so, yeah, and so, and, and so Richard, you know, feel free to, to, to jump in here if I say anything that is not consistent with your understanding. What what this is, you know, any any use determination has not been made yet. So so so, so those are kind of two different issues. What is before us here? Is this is this? FRC, the formula retail clearance, dealing with kind of square footage and space, 
Um, I would, I would, I would one say that the, the use is not is not before you, and and two, I would caution everyone to to make any any prejudgment on whether a use is or is not allowed. Um, I understand that you know what what the code says, but the only reason I say that is not to not to dissuade anyone, not to take one position or the other. But should that issue come back before you at a subsequent hearing, you would not want the, the statements made tonight. To, to prejudice that or, or, or cast any dispersions on whether or not you can, you can kind of be a, a uh, you know, a, a non-biased decision maker. So, so my understanding of, of what's before you right now, and Richard, correct me if I'm wrong, is that, is that this is all about the square footage and the space and whether or not the FRC complies with the formula retail ordinance in terms of size and, 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 and in relation to the size of the in, in entire shopping center, correct, Richard? Right, so there's two parts to this. The one is the amount of square footage and size relation formula retail, and, and that's actually what is here tonight with the Planning Commission. And then the second part of this is the use. Um, that falls on me. And I have not made a decision yet if this use is uh, consistent or, you know, that, that's still in the works. Uh, this is a step in getting into that direction. Now, uh, on the use issue, I'll start by saying that if somebody disagrees with the outcome of it, whether it be favorable or negative, um, it, it, my decision is appealable to the Planning Commission. And I think that's what Pat's getting at, is that if this gets appealed to you, uh, we have to be conscientious that any discussion we have tonight uh, doesn't preclude us from having uh, you as commissioners sit on the dais to discuss the appeal of my decision. Um, but on this, and, and Pat can help me with this, we did review this with the city attorney's office, and um, Pat can also stop me from going in too far. But just to give a quick overview, uh, the idea here is that you know Tesla sells their vehicles online. Uh, you don't actually go to a dealership and uh, sit down, I guess, and haggle car prices, and there's a, a car lot. Uh, so it's it's online. This is more of a vehicle education center and accessories. Yes, they would like to do, I believe it's eight test drives a day by appointment only, one test drive at a time. And they also wish to park three cars on site. And the reason why staff is considering this is because there are other businesses in that sh uh, shopping center that have comings and goings. For example, there's five, I guess it was, comings and goings of the dry cleaners van, the pizza delivery uh, service that'll be, I think it's Diamore's there. And then also Whole Foods has their deliveries, which I guess you could use the word of sanction through Whole Foods. But then there's also Instacart and Uber Eats and things we don't have a way to track going in and out of that. So the in and out part, um, it seems to be comparable with the other retail uses. And like I said, the reason why we were considering it is because of the fact that it, it's not a, a car lot where you're actually going to go there, pick up a car and drive it off the lot. It's an educational area. Um, the applicant's representative, I believe I'm probably going to mess up on pronouncing the name. I think it's Patrick. Uh, is available. He has signed up to speak so he can answer any questions and then also Jessica can add to what I was saying. But uh, needlessly to say, I have not approved anything. Um, I wanted this discussion to take place first uh, so that uh, we kind of air this out and make it public. Well, okay, so we, 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 question, uh, uh, Richard uh, and attorney, um, by the very nature that you have identified the user and what they do, there is a use to Tesla showroom. Okay. I mean, you've already put it in the staff report. So it's not like something we don't know what the use is. Okay. And we also have, as I understand it, and you can tell me differently, there is no process in our city planning that allows the planning director to restrict uses that are permitted without planning commission hearing, that do not use the CUP. It is permitted to, to sell batteries there. You can't say you could only sell Evinrude 
or, or energizers or something. Um, so we're, and, and this is a lawyer type thing, but there is no ability to come in if, for example, if this was Ford's new electric car and he came in and he said, well, you can only park five cars there, but 25 get parked. You can't say that because there is no process in our city government to say to limit the use if you consider it legal under the LIP. And I read you all the uses, none of them are even close. So, yes, yeah, somebody can appeal a decision, but that decision has no effect. So what are you going to appeal? And that's that's what I'd like the attorney to tell me. What could somebody appeal since there's no restriction that can be put in on it? Yeah, they would they would appeal Richard's determination of whether or not the use is 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 legal. Well, I just read you all the uses uses. Uh, who who do you appeal to? You can't appeal to the city council. You can't appeal to the coastal commission. Correct. Even though it, it may violate. The Coastal Act. Uh, so no, they would they, they they would appeal that decision to the Planning Commission, correct, Richard? That's that's how it goes. Or it goes right. And I, I think what could happen, if I'm not mistaken, is that it's like so. Let's say I approve it. I think that the they the uh, appellant could take it to the commission. The commission could determine that the use is not cons my determination of the use is not consistent for that zoning district, and I, I would say they most likely could not open uh, as proposed. Correct, Pat? Correct. Well, Pat, let me ask you this. We have businesses opening all the time in Malibu, okay? Probably one a week and going broke one a week. And the planning director makes zero decisions if they're on this table. He doesn't say, you can sell batteries here. It's already approved. There's no determination. So where does this determination come from? It's not done anywhere else. I think, so, go ahead, Richard. I'm oh, sorry. Um, technically, and Jessica could jump in because she does this a bit more than me, uh, but we ask anybody who opens a business in the city to come and file a, a planning clearance with the department. Uh, in, in that clearance, it's just our effort to make sure that the right business is going in. In other words, uh, say somebody wanted to put doctor's office in, his, in, in the zoning district wouldn't allow it. It's our opportunity to catch that and alert the person before they uh, make that transition into the space. So, I, and it's not a perfect system. I'll be completely honest with you. We don't have our own business sales tax, uh, our business licensing program, I should say. Uh, it, this is the city's attempt at some sort of understanding and control of what businesses go on in the city. Most cities would address this through a business licensing program where you need a license to do business in that city. But our licensing comes through the county. So this was a layer we added to it. Now, the county does provide us with information when there's something like a, a conditional use permit required or alcohol, uh, tobacco, something that triggers one of their uh, red flags or so to speak, or additional approvals. Uh, but you're right, John, uh, Commissioner Maza, um, there are businesses that open up that we are not aware of, but in general, everybody's supposed to get a clearance from us. Yeah, but there is no, there's no restriction you can put on them if, if it's, unless somebody says no. Now, if, if, would, would a car dealership, if the county considered this a car dealership, need a license from the county? And do we know if they consider it that? See, what, I, what I'm trying to get at here is if we don't have a process, then we should have a process. And we should have a way to, if there's a use that has never been allowed in Malibu, nobody has ever been able to sell cars in Malibu. Okay, ever in 30 years. Um, if that changes, should there be some process to to figure out how you sell cars in Malibu? Jeff uh, has to say that. That's, that's the real big question here. Uh, 
tomorrow somebody could come in and say, well, I'm going to open a store that sells uh, nuclear batteries. Well, uh, or something like that. Something we've never heard of before. If it's not on this table, I would assume it needs a variance or a CUP. Because it's when they when we adopted the LCP, we adopted this table. Jeff's got his hand up, John. Jeff, go ahead. I can't see any of you for some reason. Uh, yeah. The, if I read the staff report right, it says that this ordinance sets forth a ministerial process. Ministerial meaning is not subject to discretion. It has to just do it. Richard's made the determination. And the, the code says it shall be noticed and reported to the planning commission. And that approval should be final two days after clearance if it's reported as reported to the uh, commission unless rescinded by the director. Do we have anything to do here? I mean, other than just say thank you very much for reporting this. Is there any action we can take? Well, I think the, pro the problem. No, yeah, let me, I'm, that question is for is for is for Richard. I'm, well, if I, there's no action we can take, then we can talk about you know, yeah, we got this problem, we got this problem, we got this problem. I know we've got a lot of time to fill up because we've continued almost everything on the agenda, but come on, guys. If there's nothing we can do, let's just say okay and move on, and you guys can talk offline about all the things that the city council should do to remedy this problem. But, Richard, have we got – is there anything for us to do here? No, I, I think the issue here is the use, and the use is – you're right, uh, Commissioner Jennings. The use isn't what's on the table, Then Pat uh, can help explain – uh, the use is not what's on the table before the commission, and yes, uh, the the use is a separate application that isn't uh, at the level of the planning commission yet. That correct? It would be good to discuss with me, and I think uh, Pat will clarify that. Um, uh, if there's anything else I can add, like I mentioned, the applicant is available to speak. I think it's Patrick, uh, but right. Well, can I ask Pat, Pat a question, Pat? If we just go, okay, you reported to us which is what we're being asked to do. At what point is any document issued that somebody can appeal? And do we ever hear about it? Because our code, our municipal code says, you may appeal any decision by the planning director. But in right. my, it's what I understand is happening here is no decisions being made. Well, b before you right now, no. My understanding is that in subsequently in the future that that decision will be made at which point a formal determination will be will, will be decided by Richard and that is what would determine the use and whether or not someone can appeal that but is there any document notice record of that decision that's open to the public is there any because I've never heard of one in Malibu there is no notice that is sent to the public. Um, there is an official document. It will be public record. However, I think that what we could do is if there are people that are concerned, we would be more than glad to add them as interested parties so that they could have a copy of anything that I approve, uh, that written document. Because there, like I said, there will be a, a, Jessica can correct me, it's about three or four pages long, um, but there will be a document that could be appealed, yes. But to get that document, they have, somebody has to write you an email saying, I want that document. That is correct, because under our code, these don't require a public notice. And so that's part of the reason why, um, you know, we're doing this in the procedure we're doing it tonight is that, as I mentioned earlier when I spoke, this is the first step in it. and adding some transparency to make sure people are aware of what I'm doing. Um, you know, I've been blessed with this uh, opportunity <laughs> to make that decision. <laughs> okay, so what do they call, what do they email you? What is the title of the document they want? It is the planning clearance, correct, Jessica? That's correct. The, the planning clearance document for the Tesla application. Okay, I understand that. I uh, I just want to point out we had one other situation like this where we had somebody in the planning department okay a wine service takeout and then 
several months later, we had a CUP hearing on it. So we got to be consistent here. Uh, okay. So does anybody have a motion or a comment? I just want to clarify. So really, if we, it was, it's not relevant what kind of business this is. Really, all that we're signing off on is that this is, um, it is a, they have more than 10 stores nationwide, worldwide. So they are meeting that formula retail requirement, reviewing the calculation and it's totally separate topic as to what the business is. I mean, just, just to replay what we're signing off on right now. Are we even saying that they got to have 10 locations? We're not talking about number of locations. We're not talking about the business at all. All we're saying is 4,000 square foot space that, no. is that right? I'm just trying to understand what it is we're voting on or we're right. Getting That's what I'm trying to get to too. Yeah. 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 And my understanding was that this, this is one of the non-exempt uh, uh, retailers, you know, that's, that's all I'm trying to call out by more than 10 nationwide, you know, Tesla is not some mom and pop local um, Malibu store. So we're signing off on it being uh, under 4,000 square feet and it being um, non, uh, non exempt formula retail. Here's the calculation. We're going to go and approve their use, a separate topic, which we may or may not be involved in. Correct. Okay. Can then I, I, I get it. I'll, I'll make the motion to, to uh, receive and file. But I don't think we need to say that. Yeah. Yeah. I have one last question. Now, will somebody want to second that? I'll second it. it, it I have one last question, and that is what is the appeal fee? And where is it in the code? Um, I don't have, I, I, I would take a minute to look this up, um, but it's in the beginning part of Chapter 17 under the administration. And it would just be our standard five hundred dollar appeal uh, appeal fee uh, for this. That's a, that's a bite. That's five hundred dollars down the tubes. Okay. Uh, so, any comments? Yes. This is a receive and file. You don't want to make a motion on it because that implies that you're somehow approving something. Just receive and file, and to say if there are other no other comments, we'll move on to something else on the agenda. I think the next one is the postal protection thing of it. The beach. Okay, is there any objection to receive and file? Received and filed. There you go. Okay. Uh, is that it for consent? Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> ID is yeah, next. No. So our next continue, continue, continue. I believe our next item is 5B. Is that correct? Yep. Okay. Uh, 5B is uh, Malibu Living Shoreline Project Coastal Development Permit Number 20-045, an application for the restoration of 1.1 acres of sandy beach and dune habitat adjacent to Zuma Lagoon and two acres of sandy beach and four dune habitat at Westward Beach Point Doom State Park on seven beach parcels, zone open space. Um, I'm just going to read the addresses, not the APNs. 30050 PCH, 6900 Western Beach Road, 7150 Western Beach Road, 7180 Western Beach Road, and three unaddressed properties. May we have a staff report? Yes, thank you, Chair Mazza and members of the Planning Commission. Uh, my name is David Ng, and I am the case planner on, uh, for this application before you tonight um, at the primary address of 30050 Pacific Coast Highway. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this application is for um, a coastal development permit number 20-045, and it's for work at Zuma Beach um, and Point Dune State Beach on the westerly side of Point Dune. Uh, the primary project parcel is uh, 350 Pacific Coast Highway, but as you mentioned in the agenda, uh, uh, it also includes six other uh, parcels, some of which are unaddressed. They're listed here uh, just for reference, and uh, the parcels are outlined in red in the vicinity map. Next slide, please. And uh, this slide just shows the specific project sites uh, shown in more detail. Uh, Zuma Lagoon uh, to the left here, and 
we have multiple sites um, on Point Doom State Beach in blue on the right. Next slide, please. Um, so this project involves uh, the following. Uh, it involves removing non-native invasive species and seeding and planting native vegetation. Uh, it includes post and rope fencing along pathways, um, installing wood slat and wire dune fencing, and also installing interpretive signage. Next slide, please. The applicant, uh, the Bay Foundation, they're proposing the project with three primary goals in mind. These include increasing shoreline resiliency, protecting coastal infrastructure from sea level rise and flooding, and increasing community engagement through an enhanced beach experience, outreach, and public education. Uh, the slide here uh, with this pair of images are illustrative of um, some of the existing conditions at Zuma and Point Dune State Beaches where invasive species such as um, ice plant, um, they'll be hand removed and replaced with native vegetation that will be planted through seeding. Next slide, please. And that new vegetation um, in combination with new dune fencing will facilitate formation of historic dunes. Um, this will be accomplished by passive means such as sand accumulation over time. Uh, this project does not include, uh, it does not propose any uh, grading. Next slide, please. Um, so this slide is a more detailed diagram of the restoration activities to occur uh, just west of Zuma Lagoon. Next slide. And this slide shows the other sites at Point Dune State Beach that are proposed for restoration. Altogether, um, there are a total of 3.1 acres of beach and dune habitat that will be restored across the seven parcels. Next slide. Um, in addition to the restoration activities, the project includes three foot tall posts and rope fencing that will form uh, boundaries and symbolic pathways around the selected restoration sites. Um, it'll also include three foot tall wood and slat dune fencing, similar to the ones at the top right on the slide, and they'll be located within the restoration sites. And lastly, uh, the project will also include a uh, total of four interpretive signs that will be erected on three foot tall uh, posts. And the image on the bottom uh, uh, right um, is an example of signs that have gone out um, up um, um, out elsewhere for this program. Next slide. Uh, this is a site plan of the Zuma Lagoon project site showing the rope fencing um, in red. Uh, dune fencing will be located within and the location of the two signs are denoted by the blue stars. Next slide. Um, and at the Point Dune State Beach site, uh, we do have the same type of rope fencing to be installed around the restoration sites uh, with dune fencing within. Um, and there are two additional signs uh, denoted by the blue stars. And next slide. Lastly, uh, this project site is located within the 100 foot um, environmentally sensitive habitat area buffer. Uh, that's at the top left of the slide of this slide and uh, also actually at the lower uh, right in those kind of in those green dash circles. Typically, the development within these ESHA areas requires supplemental review by the Environmental Review Board, uh, but because the local coastal program does allow all the proposed work um, in a near ESHA, uh, no ERB review was required. Next slide. Uh, so to conclude the proposed scope and uh, work, um, it conforms with all the provisions of the local coastal program and the Malibu Municipal Code. Uh, based on this and the findings made in the record, uh, staff recommends approval of the CDP number 20-045. Uh, staff and the applicant team are available for questions if you have any. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Okay, are there any disclosures? No. Yes. yes, David. Uh, well, I walked around the site and I had a phone conversation this afternoon with uh, Chris Enyart of the uh, Bay Foundation, who I think is on the line, just to ask a co couple of additional questions based on the report. Okay, uh, Jeff? Um, no, no, no disclosures, no. Dave? No, none. Chris? 
Yeah, I usually go down there a few times a week and this uh, afternoon I stopped by again. I, I did have one question just um, a little bit kind of what's well, the northwest, I guess, of uh, some of the development area. There's a lot of scour, which has exposed a lot of rocks. Um, I just wanted to see if this project would help kind of keep that filled in and just... Uh, uh, Chris, yeah. let, let's do disclosures and we'll have the last question. Uh, I have, I, I've been on, I've driven that beach maybe 5,000 times or walked it, uh, learned nothing new. Okay, Chris, uh, questions? Yeah, I just, just, just um, if, if this would help address that scour we're seeing where those rocks are all exposed, uh, just for some context, because the development itself, or I should say the the activities are, are not exactly on there, but just uh, if anyone could address that in the public comments, I'd appreciate that. Okay, uh, could we put up the uh, map uh, and show us where that scour is? The uh, overhead we had there just a minute ago. Well, there was the one that covered the whole thing all the way to Zuma. There you go. Whoops. Well, there. Chris, so which one of those is this where you see the scour? Yeah, so that um, first RF1, the 0.29 acres, just in this image, a little bit to the left of that um, of that ice plant, which is what mainly makes up that hill, if I remember right. Um, there's a little kind of a, a road carved um, just to the west of there and just all the sand has been scoured away and it's just a bunch of rocks exposed high tide you can't really walk across there i just wondered if this uh effort would help to kind of fill that in and just maybe help understand that as, as we're talking to this okay um do you have any answer to that um i don't have the answer to that i i would defer to the applicant team uh to address uh if that's something that they looked at when in selecting the sites Okay. Uh, and it, yeah, it's uh, Karina Johnson and yeah, Chris, I believe, is on the line as well. Okay. We'll have any other questions of commissioners? Yeah, John. Go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, can you put the slide back up again? Uh, it's the it's the mouth of Zuma Creek. It's right after the one where you're showing the little um, slide seven. fencing stuff. Next one. Okay. Um, a long time ago, I was on the county beach commission, and there were and the uh, LA County beaches attempted to do some uh, work in the same area uh, that had some effect on the flow of the creek. Uh, ended up creating um, some problems, uh, a mosquito infestation that, that ended up with the county having to cut lines through so that mosquito repellent or poison or whatever could be could be deposited. I think if you look at the crosshatch area that's to, to the right there, that's that's the remnant of, of that project. And so I guess my question is, has, has, has this project been analyzed to see whether it's going to cause any changes in the flow of, uh, of, the, of the creek and the marsh and the lagoon area there? Uh, and if so, have they analyzed it in terms of the problems that arose? I don't know, maybe it was 15, 20 years ago uh, when the earlier project was um, had some problem. So those are, that would be my question to the applicant. Is that a question to the uh, appellant, uh, the uh, applicant? I'm sorry, John. Uh, are you addressing that to staff or the applicant? Uh, I, I'm sure staff doesn't know the answer. But, okay. Uh, we'll see if the, if the applicant can. Help us out. Okay, I've got another question for uh, the applicant, and that is, there's a reported concentration of homeless in this area. Um, has that been addressed, uh, and how? Um, and then the other question would be, tomorrow morning we have a 8.5 king tide. Do we do we have any idea what happens to this project in weird tides like that? Anybody else have any questions? Okay, I'm going to open the public hearing to the applicant. I believe we're starting with Karina Johnston, 15 minutes. 
Yes, hello. Um, I am going to zoom through these slides in hopes of spending some time answering the commissioner's questions. So I just want to thank everybody for the opportunity to be here today in front of you guys. I really want to thank the city of Malibu staff. They've been really active partners. Um, we're, we're the co-applicant with the Los Angeles County Department of Beaches and Harbors, but city of Malibu has been really active participants in the um, planning and design process. Um, we can skip through a couple of slides. Um, I'm Karina Johnston. I'm the science director for the Bay Foundation and the director of programs for LMU's Coastal Research Institute. And my colleague, Chris Inyar, is also available for questions. Um, David already mentioned a lot of these goals. We can skip through a couple of these slides. Um, keep going, please. Um, this slide you already saw, this gives you context. Um, I'll, I'll reference this when answering Commissioner Mark's questions. Um, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Um, so this is a, a little bit more detail just to show some of the strategic placement of a couple of those chunks of sand fencing. Um, again, we're talking about symbolic post and rope fencing around the perimeter areas, maintaining public access ways that were designed really specifically to be perpendicular to the wind flow to give the best possible enhancement of coastal resiliency. Uh, next slide, please. Just a couple of other photo photos of the project site, a lot of existing ice plant cover, a few native species you can see in the upper left-hand corner, and then really large myoporum trees in that background, back left corner of Suma. Next slide, please. Um, we also partner with a lot of internship students who are doing some COVID safe field work for us. I just thought you might enjoy those photos. Next slide, please. Um, this is uh, another project condition area. You saw the before and afters. You can go ahead and click through to the um, thank you partner slide if you want. David already showed these, which is great. There's another before and after. So um, I just want to emphasize the the goal of this project is to um, do a pilot demonstration project in city of Malibu to help support infrastructure protection from things like sea level rise. Um, Commissioner Maza mentioned uh, really, uh, or I believe it was him, the uh, really interesting high tide scenario. And so we can use these um, really intense king tides to understand active flooding a little bit more. We also have projected sea level rise scenarios, um, different erosion patterns. And we worked with the county to really target um, the locations of these projects to help try to protect infrastructure like um, two restroom facilities, some parking lot facilities, um, and other lifeguard um, areas. And I just want to stop here and say that I really appreciate all the support from, again, from the city, um, from, count, from council members Wagner and Peak, um, our partners, LA County Beaches and Harbors, City of Malibu, State Parks, um, and then all the other folks on this um, uh, slide who, without whom it would not be um, possible. We've also had some really great public outreach tours that happened here in advance of COVID. So we were lucky to be able to do some, um, do some public tours and get some community feedback that went into the restoration planning. Um, at, at, its, at its core, this is really an invasive species removal project and native seeding project with the hopes that we can do it strategically to help protect our coastline from sea level rise. Um, so with that, that I, I think that, that concludes the, the presentation that I wanted to kind of highlight a few things, but I'd like to address the questions um, if that's an appropriate time right now. Yes, it is. So Commissioner, Commissioner Marks asked about uh, Westward Beach, the, the chunk a little bit to the north of the Point Doom area, and that, um, is, is outside the scope of our um, project, um, but for a couple of reasons. We actually talked about it with LA County. They were very concerned that their driving access road that you mentioned is experiencing active erosion in, in the current scenario, um, but it was decided that it might be a little bit more intensive um, actions that needed to happen there. This is really a passive restoration um, just to try to get some native vegetation to start doing some demonstration work. Um, but our hope, but we're in discussions with the county and we've done some active baseline monitoring there to try to help inform them in that discussion. Uh, so while outside the project scope, we hope that this informs that because we know there are lots of areas in Malibu that are experiencing a lot more significant erosion currently than, than here. 
Um, so some of those might require a little bit more active interventions rather than this sort of passive habitat restoration. Um, Commissioner Jennings, I believe, asked about the mosquito area and the treatment area. Um, that is, um, again, outside the scope of this project, but we are aware of it. We've been talking to the county. Uh, this project is not in any uh, jurisdictional wetland habitat areas. Um, and so it's really focused on the dune project um, to the other side of the lagoon. But we did have that conversation about how the mouth of the lagoon moves around. The original project moved, um, had some planting and sand happening closer to the ocean front. And it was determined um, by the scientific advisory panel to, to kind of scooch the project site back up into that kind of kidney shape that you see on the Zuma beach side. Um, so the goal is really to not have any impacts on wetlands or the flora and fauna that kind of inhabit that area and not to change the hydrology at all of the lagoon. Um, rather, it's really just sort of a replacement of the invasive vegetation that's kind of creeping into the riparian vegetation um, on the, along the periphery. There's also a restoration done um, by California State Parks on the other side of the lagoon back in the early 90s, I believe, and they um, have some really well-established native scrub plants and stuff over there. So we were able to model a little bit of the plant palette after that um, restoration effort as well. Um, we did shift a little bit of um, planning around after the Woolsey fire as well with all the sediment that came down um, and all the kind of movement of that um, burn debris around and off the beach by LA County. Um, we've been really grateful for their partnership too. They've been very active um, supporters of these types of evaluations here. And then lastly, Commissioner Maza uh, asked about homeless populations. We have seen several around. Um, we did see several tent encampments, encampments in the riparian area adjacent to the project site. Um, right now, that's outside the scope of what this phase um, will be implementing. Um, so it's our hope to assess um, and have adaptive management strategies in place for if anything gets disturbed or moved or um, right now, we're not actively um, moving anybody out of a, an active encampment. <coughs> so so it, it, I think we'll have to kind of assess that and, and see as we move forward. Um, right now, most of what our activities are in are in existing ice plant covered areas that, that just have a lot of um, um, sort of kind of pathways that people have just kind of made by moving from the parking lots out to the beach. Um, so those will be enhanced and, and preserved access ways as well. And those were the questions I wrote down. If I, if I missed one, I apologize. Please, um, happy he to has a question and then Jeff. Uh, I, just a quick question. You know, how soon do you think you'll start seeing some results from your work? Uh, yeah, great question. We um, have a similar project with a little bit of a different scale that we implemented in um, Santa Monica Beach um, in the December 2016. And in some places we've seen about half a meter of sand accretion. Um, and so I think it we've learned a lot from that one and several other projects that we have ongoing in the planning phases. And we've got a really strong network of scientists throughout California that we're kind of cross comparing some of these um, these um, results with. And, and the long story short is things like the segments of sand fencing um, enhance the, the ability for the dune to form very quickly. Um, and so some of those areas might see accretion of two to three feet in, um, in a couple of years. And other areas, it's more of a long-term commitment of the plants growing on top of themselves over time and, and forming these small hummocks that then trap more sand that then grow on top of themselves. Also great for carbon sequestration as well, because all that plant material ends up buried in the dunes. I mean, I think this is a great idea. I mean, and so I just going to encourage you somewhere down the line, once you start seeing some positive results, come back and tell us. Because you know, if we learned that these things are really working well, if you come back the next time with another project and make we make make it easier to get approval and get it going. I would love that. That would be great. I'd be more than happy. We'll we'll be producing annual public reports um, and, and posting them on our on our website as well. But I'd be more than happy to come give a more formal presentation too. That would be great. Great. Okay, Jeff. Yeah, my question is sort of the flip side of Steve's. Um, the particular down on the on the um, 
state beach portion. There's, there's large areas that are going to be enclosed by these symbolic fences. And the idea is that people will not be allowed to occupy those spaces, correct? We're not going to have um, them be restricted because right now there's no um, listed species that, that are in there. So if people wanted to, I mean, we're, we're not going to actively manage to kick people out, but we hope that they're sort of discouraged from having a high numbers of people on those areas because of the, the, the need for the dunes to form. But, but our hope at the Bay Foundation is that this is an intersection of new types of recreation and recreational activities with dunes on our beach. So my hope eventually would be to have no fencing and have just sort of people be limited in, in accessing them because they just don't wanna trample the vegetation. But these systems are actually really, really resilient to sand blowing on top of them, being buried, being stepped on. Um, all right, so so the idea is that that at at um, assuming it all goes well, that there won't be any restrictions where people can go. It's just going to be a question of whether they want to go there or not. And sitting on That's a correct. flat sand might be better than sitting on a on a bush. Um, so let's say that things don't go well. Uh, what's your time frame in terms of of evaluating this project? If if we go th Five years and you're really not getting any doom development do you pull the plug is there any analysis of when it would be determined or how it would be determined whether the project's been successful or not yeah that's a great question there's there's pretty limited success criteria because there's there's limited information on these on these types of um, projects in southern california city of malibu is is really only the second one in our entire region um, to to implement this and so um, we do have an annual check-in. We do have um, monitoring that happens um, quarterly and semi-annually for all of these different parameters, biological, um, even human use. Um, and then, <clears throat> excuse me, at a five-year period, we'll do a, a more formal check-in and see if any adaptive management efforts need to be undertaken, any fences need to be removed, anything like that. Um, perhaps sign replacement or, or things like that if there's um, issues. Um, but we have, we at the Bay Foundation have a longer term commitment of, you know, 10 years or so to make sure that this, the site's maintained to um, weed any, any, any invasive species that kind of crop in and to really kind of keep checking in. Uh, so the success criteria are um, really tied to things that would trigger adaptive management strategies. So if, if invasive cover gets too high, then we go in and, and weed it with volunteers or, or with our um, kind of community groups. Um, if, it, if there's, um, you know, burial or something like that of sand fencing, then it's actually a benefit because it means that dune then grew more than three feet. Um, and so there's different, different triggers for different management actions. I'd be very surprised. I think this site is really primed for vegetation. Um, just having the ice plant there means that there's a little bit higher organic content in the soil. And so um, it's my belief um, that the, the plants will, will do well. Um, but we don't have specific triggers associated with uh, specific dune heights. Um, we also have different triggers associated with um, like nuisance sand or something like that. If, if more, sand, you know, they, they periodically clean off um, the parking lots right behind um, Zoom and Point Dune beaches pretty frequently and, and blow the sand kind of back onto the dune system. So um, that'll be one of the things that we track as well. Our, our hope is that we're going to reduce nuisance sand um, in that capacity. Uh, see, the, the reason that I'm asking these questions in a way is because we're, we're granting a coastal development permit, which is essentially a perpetual license to this stuff and and um in, in a more it seems to in a way kind of a more appropriate model for what you're doing would might be a conditional use permit i'm just analogizing from a conditional use permit which you know allows the project to go forward allows a period of time for its evaluation uh but doesn't give a permanent um a permanent setting to something which which you know in 10 years 15 years you may have decided is 
not practical, or maybe the sea level has already risen to the point where you can't do it anymore. I don't know. I'm saying that, that it's, I, it, it makes me a little uncomfortable to be giving um, essentially perpetual uh, permit rights to something which may or may not be intended to be a permanent uh, project. But nonetheless, um, well, that's yeah, we do in, you to answer, so uh, I'm just, just uh, making a comment. Well, we do intend it to be permanent, especially in that it will kind of naturally adapt over time, too. So our hope is that, you know, the vegetation continues to kind of grow and thrive it, because all of the areas right immediately outside of it are groomed. The vegetation won't spread, so it'll be very kind of contained. Um, and L.A. County Department of Beaches and Harbors, I don't want to speak for them since they're um, not on the phone right now, but they are very supportive partners and committed to the long-term maintenance of the area as well. And so because they own and manage that beach, um, it's, I think the the partnership has sort of all of us together. Um, so I, I completely understand your point. I think we appreciate the, the public process um, that goes along with the CDP application form. It's been historically what the Coastal Commission has requested us to do for these types of projects. And so um, we kind of followed that pattern for, for this one as well. And Jeff? Yep. Chris? Sorry, just, just uh, I think um, I think I know the answer to this one, but I'm just kind of looking over what you provided and what you've been saying. Um, just to also clarify for really the driver of this, with those uh, invasive um, with the ice plant coming in there, that doesn't grow on top of itself, I assume. So we don't get the same growth we would with like your native beech burr or whatever, where it would keep growing as it got a little buried, more would grow. So it would keep extending the height of that dune. Is that basically the goal they're going after by shifting the plant type there? That's exactly right. There, that's exactly right. The, the ice plant has sort of differently shaped leaves and isn't isn't the same, doesn't have the same adaptation characteristics that the native plants do. So like red sand verbena has these small sort of sticky leaves that are kind of cup shaped that really trap and accrete the sediment very quickly. The ice plant is um, pretty stable. It's been there for a long time. It's been it's been maintained um, the areas around it by the county. So, um, but it, ice plant has a number of really detrimental um, you know characteristics. It's not just it's not just altering the hydrology. It's altering the soil chemistry. It's um, you know kind of changing. It's it's limited in its in its benefits to wildlife and and we hope that the site full of natives will also be more aesthetically pleasing and beautiful with really nice refined pathways and signs. Um, so it's our hope that people will find a new way to engage with this beach and and learn um, potentially learn something um, while they're at it. But you're you're absolutely right. That's one of the challenges associated with ice plant. It can grow on top of itself, but it usually just sort of gets really heavy and then mm -hmm. slides around and causes some erosion or starts dying back. And then just just as that natural growth, say with the beach burr, whatever, as it grows on top of itself, if is there ever a point where um, that becomes at all um, where somebody could kind of sink into it or risk injury or anything? I'm just thinking a worst case scenario. I'm assuming voids don't form or anything as it has that natural growth. Yeah, it's actually pretty dense because um, okay. it's it's really kind of layers and layers of plant growth on top of itself. So it's it's when you walk on it, it feels more solid really than a, than just kind of wandering along the beach in a normal way. Um, I will say the one the one hazard is that the beach burr seeds are a little bit prickly, so it might also discourage people from from walking in there. <laughs> okay, great, thank you. Sure. David, do you have any questions? Okay, I, I have just one last question, I guess. Um, what do you do if you get like an 83 storm that comes in on a high tide, takes the whole beach? Do you do you have funding to start over again or you run and hide or, or <laughs> how, how does, obviously you don't have funding for the next 200 years, but uh, I'm just wondering if, you know, in 83, it took everything, so. Mm -hmm. uh, just wondering what happens then. Um, well, I do, you know, while I hope that that doesn't happen, as a scientist, um, some really intensive sort of storm seasons would be interesting from an evaluation perspective to be able to test the site against the control areas that don't have this type of 
um, kind of stable plant growth resiliency. So um, while I would not I would not appreciate, you know, if the, the entire beach um, disappeared, I think there would be an interesting that will be studying it the whole time. So it it can at least inform some of these other aspects of different projects. Um, so this is this is kind of the the greenest end of the kind of green to gray adaptation spectrum that that we can that we can have really. And so we have an opportunity here to evaluate what this kind of softscape or or living shoreline resiliency looks like compared to some of the hard infrastructure. So some good storms and some good flooding would actually the plants would end up being fine if the whole beach disappears. We would really have to talk about adaptive management strategies at that point. And um, we don't we don't have this this project is grant funded and and so we wouldn't have the funding in place to replace it. But we we do have a long term commitment um, to the site, and so I um, I would hope that we would be able to find more funding. Uh did you were you required to do a 100 year uh, sea rise sea level study and and uh, how did that turn out as far as 100 years from now yeah we did we did work with usgs to run different modeling scenarios under different dune um, accretion scenarios and uh, what it looks like is that the areas with that would be vegetated would be less likely to have erosion and more likely to have um, flooding protection for the infrastructure behind it. Um, but we don't have a formal analysis associated with that. It was it was running um, some of the different um, sea level rise and coastal storm modeling system, the Cosmos models in, in different scenarios. Okay, and then at what point do you decide to take the fences down? That's, That's a great- there forever, right? Yeah, that's a great question. The um, historically, the Coastal Commission has suggested that um, you know they can either be pulled up over time, or once they're buried, they're just sort of permanently in place. Um, so we were going to test a, a hybrid approach here and have some areas with smaller stakes that we pull up over time and then remove after about um, probably three to five years. Um, and that's in our adaptive management plan um, as part of the restoration plan. Um, but there likely will be um, some perimeter symbolic fencing up for the duration of the establishment of the dune system. And so by, by my best estimate, that's probably five to seven years out to have a stabilized system that has really good plant cover and is very stabilized at that point. Um, our adaptive management triggers would let us remove the perimeter fencing um, so it, it really at that point depends on the aesthetic, um, but we would work with City of Malibu to determine that. Okay, and then uh, do you have anything at all to do with the proposed uh, doom restoration at uh, Broad Beach or anywhere beyond Zuma? I do not know that. Okay. The, we do have other living shoreline projects. We have one at, at Dockweiler Beach and one um, in partnership with City of Manhattan Beach. And we have an existing one on Santa Monica Beach. Um, so we're kind of in, in the living shoreline world, but we have not had um, any connection to the Hey, we got a question, John. No, no, actually, I would like to move the question if I could. I'd I'll like second. to. Uh, I'll second it. Anybody uh, have any comments? Oh, if, no, I have to close the public hearing first. Now, uh, are there any other speakers? No, nope, just the applicant. Applicants. Yeah, I'm closing the public hearing. David, now can you make your motion? <laughs> yes, I would move that we adopt the resolution and uh, adopt the staff report and determine that the uh, the CDP uh, should be uh, issued. Okay, I'll second that. Authority. Any other mm -hmm. comments? Okay, can we have a roll call, please? Commissioner Weil. Yes. Chair Mazza. Yes. Commissioner Jennings. Yes. Commissioner Uring? Yes. Vice Chair Marks? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. Good deal. Now we are about five minutes, John. Uh yes. Uh we'll have a we'll meet back here at uh how about fifteen after eight. Uh everybody don't talk to each other and all that stuff.
Sorry about that. Are we ready to roll? Yep. Richard? Rich is not back yet. Okay, then we're not ready to roll. <laughs> there. Right here. Okay. <laughs> we got everybody here? Okay, I'm going to open the public hearing. On Wait, item. I'm going to open the, I'm sorry, <laughs> the Planning Commission meeting uh, dated November 16th, 2020 on item 5D, which is the Coastal Development Permit number 17-104, variance numbers 19-035, 19-036, and minor modification num number 20-012, an application for new single family residents and exterior site improvements at 3620 Noranda Lane, Malibu, California. Okay, may we have a staff report? Yes. Good evening, Chair Maza and members of the Planning Commission. The item you have before you tonight is for Coastal Development Permit number 17-104 for the project located at 3620 Noranda Lane. Next slide, please. This slide demonstrates the vicinity map and aerial photograph of the project site and the surrounding area. The project site is located on the north side of Naranda Lane and is located in the rural residential five acre zoning district. The subject site is bordered to the north by a vacant lot outside of the city boundaries, to the east by a vacant lot, and to the west and the south by single family residential development. The proposed development is located entirely within ESHA and a variance has been requested for construction within ESHA, and the development is limited to a 10,000 square foot development area and totals 9,257 square feet. Additionally, the proposed development is subject to hillside residential development standards, and as such is limited to the maximum TDSF by 25% and a maximum height limit of 35 feet as measured from the lowest point to the highest point of each structure. The proposed development is compliant with hillside development standards. Next slide, please. This exhibit shows an aerial overlay of the prior development that was subsequently destroyed in the 1985 fire with the proposed development. Next slide, please. The project includes a 5,285 square foot single family residence a 2,594 square foot basement and subterranean garage, a new OWTS, a new swimming pool and spa and associated pool equipment, new lower level and upper level decks, 5,200 square feet of new landscaping, a new 25,000 gallon underground water tank, a new 5,000 underground water tank, and 432 yards of non-exempt grading. The project also includes three discretionary requests, a variance for encroachment into ESHA, a variance for construction on slopes steeper than two and a half to one, and a minor modification to reduce the required front yard setback by 50% by 50 from the required 65 feet to 32.5 feet. Next slide, please. Pictured here is the site plan, which shows the new single family residence and various site improvements. Next slide, please. Pictured here is the color-coded slope analysis. The proposed single-family residence and associated development is outlined in black. The proposed project includes a various, as previously mentioned, for construction on slopes steeper than two and a half to one for a portion of the single-family residence, as well as for the swimming pool. Next slide, please. Here's the basement slash subterranean garage floor plan, which includes a two car enclosed garage, the media room and a game room. Next slide, please. Here's the lower level floor plan, which includes the master suite and an additional bedroom and associated bathrooms. Next slide, please. 
Here's the upper level floor plan, which includes the kitchen, dining area, and living room, as well as outdoor deck. Next slide, please. Pictured here are the north and south elevations of the single family residence. Next slide. Here are the east and west elevations. Next slide, please. And pictured here are the site story poll photographs that were taken on October 6, 2020. Next slide, please. Pictured here are the project renderings. The photo to the top left is facing south, showing the single family residence and the proposed exterior decks. The lower middle photo shows the, the project facing north and the upper right photo shows the project facing to the west. Next slide, please. In conclusion, staff recommends the adoption of resolution and the approval of the CDP with the inclusion of the discretionary requests. Staff and the applicant team are available for any questions. Thank you. Okay, do we have disclosures? Yes, I visited the site and then had a subsequent phone conversation with the applicants and the architect. I uh, did not discuss anything other than what's in the report. Steve. Uh, uh, John Mazza and I visited the site, met with Vitas and met with the owners of the property. Uh, walked around, got a perspective of what the property looked like and where the development would take place. Uh, came up with a couple questions we weren't really covering in the staff report regarding, you know, there's a whole bunch of grading going on. It's no really identified process. It said how much is going to have to be exported and how you're going to do it down those steep roads. But we'll cover that when we get into the uh, applicant's presentation. <clears throat> um, what did I miss, Chris? Yeah, I did visit the property. Uh, didn't learn much more beyond the staff report. Um, just got a sense, though, of the uh, topography. It's uh, it's uh, impressive there. Uh, did Jeff, did you disclose? I didn't, but I did the same thing that Chris did. Okay, and I met with Steve. Uh, I'm a little bit agoraphobic, so I realized that I was a little bit agoraphobic. Uh, but that's all I learned. Nothing that's <laughs> staff return. Okay, uh, do we have public speakers or do we have questions before? No questions from the council? Uh, I would hear the testimony. Of a, I'd rather hear the testimony first. Okay. Um, I, I do have a quick one if I may, John. Sure. Uh, Jessica, I was trying to go through I, um, in the uh, calculations, there's a, in the illustrations, there's quite a bit of overhang that seems to be further than six feet. Um, is that factored into the two thirds calculation anywhere? I just wasn't sure if you could direct me to the right page to look at for that. Um, let me go ahead and take a look at what page that's on. And then after the presentation, I can get you that information. Thank you very much. Th that's all, John. Thank you. Uh, yes. uh, yeah, one more quick one for just, um, just in the in the variance for the slope steeper than uh, 2.5 to 1. Uh, one of the findings is that other homes in the neighborhood are developed on or over steep slopes. The, the two most closest lots just further up through that gate, those paths are not nearly as steep as, as this one. And I'm wondering what, what definition of neighborhood you're using to say that they're over steep slopes and where are they? Sure, we looked at the homes in the adjacent area on Naranda Lane. Um, the applicant also provided a, um, a subsequent exhibit and um, I believe was distributed today that we can pull up as well. Um, so the homes on Aranda Lane that maybe not as quite as steep slopes, but similar um, of steep slopes as well as lower on Ensignal Canyon. David, David? Yeah. Uh, and I asked the same question earlier on because there's some statements in the staff, in the staff report that say if we don't allow the applicant to build a pool on this one-to-one -one slope we're depriving him of rights that other properties have. So I asked the same question, give me addresses. I mean, where are the properties and what are the addresses where that, and I never got the addresses. There are other properties that got pools, but I don't know of any place other than this one where I've built, a, I'm building on one-to-one -one slopes that much, that much development. So I didn't, I asked the same question, didn't get a good answer. Okay, anyone else? Okay, let's open the public hearing. Uh, do we have anybody other than the applicant? 
We have the applicant team of Vitas Matari, um, Roman Staus, and Taki Staus. It looks like those are the owners and the applicant. And then we have Norman Haney. I'm not certain if he's affiliated with the applicant team, but maybe Vitas can let us know. Okay, Vitas, you're on for 15 minutes, however you want to do it. You can reserve any amount of time you want. <clears throat> Good evening, commissioners and planning staff. I hope you guys can hear me. Is that working? Yes. Oh, good, okay. So anyway, um, this is a rather unique uh, design that requires uh, you know, to address issues on this site. And I do have a series of slides. I don't know if those are readily available, if those can be shown. I can work without the slides. There we go. So on this first slide, this is an aerial image that was shot in 1980. It's the prior development and this is clearly shortly after the site was graded. And some of the rock outcroppings are still there, but most of the rocks have just been pushed over the side. And you'll see a red line there. That's the area that's somewhat dangerous. There's a rock fall hazard that exists there today because when they took the old house out and took out the foundations, they also cut a road down through there. And that's the material that's creeping down the hill and the larger chunks of bedrock that we're hoping to stabilize with a wall over there. But other than that, you can see that our new development footprint pretty much follows the area that was originally disturbed for the prior development. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, let's skip that one. We've already seen it. So here you can see the top of the hillock. We're hoping to pretty much remove this material at the top and cut the house down flat into the hill. It'll be far less visible from other parts of the canyon and the road below, and it will sit squat. We're not creating a flat pad to set the house per se, but we're burying a good portion of the house into the hill. And in doing so, we're removing some shattered bedrock and some unstable uh, surface materials. Next slide, please. In the upper left-hand corner, uh, that's the roof that's represented by those orange ribbons that you see there. But in that photo straight ahead, there's a lot of rock material that has been pushed to the side and shoved down the hill. So our goal is not to strip that material from the hillside. This is stuff that's somewhat hazardous and can roll down the hill here. We're hoping to stabilize that with a wall that's just below the house. All the other parts of this, there are large boulders that we are, we've designed into the house. We're going to keep them on site and we're looking to anchor them and cement them in place. So the idea here is to leave as much of the rugged topography showing as possible around the house. And this landscaping that we're talking about is going to be indigenous succulents and cacti. There's really nothing special. We're not doing some luxurious garden here, providing any sort of uh, typical residential landscaping. It will be indigenous plants that we hope to reintroduce all around the building. Right now, it's freshly denuded from the Woolsey fire. But we've noticed that even over the past three and a half years that almost nothing grows on this site. There's just one uh, lonely palm left from the old development. Everything else here has perished and we don't really need to disturb any etcher with our house. The grading and house are confined to the hillock, and there's just um, some brush clearance that goes down the hill. And um, this, this takes us to the issue of the etcher variance that we request. It is just for brush clearance, not for grading. And the idea is that even the wall that's down below will be in an area that is uh, rubble and rock, not an area where we're removing chaparral. Um, there, is some concern about the fact that we are building in the middle of this ESHA. And there's, in fact, the mitigation paragraph in section 4.8 of the Malibu Local Coastal Plan uh, with an option for an Alua fee for offsite conservation of habitat. And in March of 2019, such a fee was applied to a very similar project at 3605 Naranda Lane. And by the way, they also have a pool design on the steep hillside over there. Uh, can we move on to slide four? So this is what we provided, and uh, yeah, we just uh, took everything that was between the beach that was in the city, not outside city limits, but the houses that are near us are either under construction or they're burned down. And so we have these 12 developed properties downhill from us, the closest ones, and the average square footage of all 12 properties there is somewhat greater than the square footage that we are proposing. The average is around 7,387 square feet. Next slide, please. So this is what we gave you guys as the um, you know, exhibit showing there's lots of pools here. Almost everything on this side except the houses that are really close to PCH 
every one of these is really a, a hillside pool. The issue is, are these pools built into the slope or are they built on top of paths that have been graded on these slopes? Uh, there are none that are quite as extreme as ours. I have to admit that. But ours serves a secondary purpose since we do need to build that retaining wall down there and our pool will sit uphill from that wall. And that wall, just like a swimming pool, will not require additional brush clearance. It just solves a geotechnical hazard for us. So anyway, I'm saving the balance of my presentation time to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Okay, Norm. Oh, how much time do they have left? They um, have uh, seven and a half minutes. Thank you. Norm, you got three. <clears throat> Okay, you can hear me? You yep. can. All right. First of all, I want to congratulate uh, Steve on uh, becoming the next uh, group of three city council members. Um, I think he, uh, the, the years that he spent on the planning commission uh, will benefit the uh, new city council uh, in a positive way. Um, I represent the three uh, owners of the properties that are northwest of the proposed project um, behind the gate, so to speak. Um, and th they have a, a number of concerns. We're not opposed to the project. We think that it's a tough site to work on, uh, that 90% uh, of the area which they're uh, planning to develop has already been developed in the past. It's already been graded. Um, the house is unique, unique design. Um, and and the, folks, the folks that I represent are, are not opposed to the house at all. Um, but they do have the following concerns. The first is the fire department turnaround. The fire department turnaround is a couple of feet the way it's currently designed on um, uh, Jerry uh, Cable's property. We need to resolve that. We also would like to swing it six and a half degrees, rotate it clockwise so that uh, it is uh, as far away from the uh, oak tree canopy. There are two oak trees as possible. And uh, I believe that they have agreed to that. Um, it doesn't change much. It comes within three feet of the well cap. The next thing is the construction management plan. We're very concerned about uh, a construction management plan that will keep the uh, Naranda roadway open, not the whole thing, but at least uh, 10 to 12 feet so that people can get to their properties north, uh, northwest of the house. Um, and the and so we, we would like to see that construction management plan. Uh, it, it's going to be a tough site to work on. And uh, we want to be good, good neighbors. Um, but we are a little concerned about that. And la lastly, but not least, we'd like to see the roadway, uh, any damage to the roadway, to the water line, and to the electrical lines that are not underneath the roadway um be uh, bonded for and replace the damage to be fixed uh, by the applicant uh, if there is any damage um, the one of the previous uh, owners of of one of the houses that are actually under construction it was mentioned earlier he has bonded uh, over a hundred thousand dollars I think it's one hundred thousand dollars uh, towards the uh, fixing of any damage to uh, Noranda. For all intents and purposes, it's a private street. And it means that the, the people that drive it are responsible for its maintenance. Other than those three things, um, we, we believe it's a good project. All three of the property owners that I represent. And um, 
we'd like to see the management plan, the construction management plan, how it's going to be built and how the road's going to be left open. They uh, um, make sure that whatever damage is created that they're responsible for. And they uh, swing that uh, fire department. It's actually an intermediate um, fire department turnaround about six and a half degrees clockwise. And uh, that'll protect the oak trees. And it'll also uh, eliminate the um, part of it that uh, extends onto my client's uh, property. That's basically it. Okay, thank you, Norm. Any, any other speakers? Okay, uh, do you have any rebuttal? Venus? Yes, uh, in response to what Norm had pointed out, uh, we proposed to prepare a construction management plan. And of course, the, the goal is so that neighbors will not be inconvenienced and so that emergency access is properly maintained. Uh, we would certainly be able to store all materials on site and would have to request that people working on the house park at the bottom of the hill. They need to have some sort of shuttle service. So there's room for materials and maybe one or two vehicles on the site, everything else will have to be kept down in uh, an area that we would designate along Ensenal Canyon Road or off to the side of Noranda. Uh, I think we can do better than maintain the 12 feet that Norm mentioned there. I think we can keep a full 20 feet wide open all the way up and down Noranda. Noranda, the average width is 24 feet, but still I would not propose to park our vehicles on Noranda. I would keep them down on Ensenal. Um, there's also plenty of room to adjust the angle of the proposed fire appar apparatus turnaround. The issue there was, uh, the survey didn't give us the best mapping of those oak trees, and it's become clear that we can avoid any encroachment into the drip line of, of those two oak trees merely by rotating that hammerhead as uh, Norm suggested. Uh, there should be no grading near either of those oaks, and we do not need to encroach into the drip line. And we will gladly rotate the head of that uh, hammerhead closer to the well that's already existing on the property. That's a relatively simple uh, step. And I know that uh, my clients, they should be allowed to speak here, by the way. Telekin Rowan will gladly correct any repair. We look to document the condition of the road begin before we begin any work. And the understanding is that when the neighbors are done with their construction work and um, the Staus residence is completed, that I think we'd all want to get together and resurface that road anyway. It's not looking bad now. But if there's true construction damage, I can't speak for my clients, but I'm certain they would want to see it repaired and they would be good for that. So however, whatever mechanism needs to be in place to assure that the road is maintained and restored if it's damaged, I'm sure that's a go. Okay, do your clients want to speak? I believe they do, yes, please. Go ahead. Uh, good evening, Chair Massa, Vice Chair Marx, Council Member Elect Uring, members of the Planning Commission, Acting Planning Director Molika, Associate Planner Thompson, ladies and gentlemen, this is Roman Staus. I'm talking on behalf of the owners, Talke and Roman. Um, before I um, want to stress that, of course, what Norm addressed, uh, we already verbally happily agreed to facilitate, but as well here on the record. And um, after I said that, um, please allow me firstly to say Thank you to some people, if I may, if, if I may use some time. Uh, I want to say uh, thank you to Vidos Matar, um, who with his entire team, and especially Dorian Margot, worked tirelessly on this project. I want to say thanks to our geologist, Jake Holt. Um, I want to say thanks to our chief technical engineer, Eli Katiba, Kevin Poffenbarger, James Tuchscher, H.J. Berg, I want to say thanks to Richard Molika, Jessica Thompson, Jessica Clevenger, Bonnie Blue for their guidance and advice, and the city's agencies for public work, geochip, technical biology, environmental health, and as well the fire department. We received great support from our community here on the Randa Lane. Though um, being scarred after the Hootsie fire, we remain to have the shared spirit of a tiny group of people trying to do the best for each other. This is especially true for our direct neighbors, for which Norm was speaking, Aina, Jansen, Mark, Chantana, Cherry Cable. 
As the ones who have visited our property might have noticed, we are currently helping to accommodate parts of the 36 or 5 Naranda construction sites traffic. And as Norm already indicated, our neighbors can confirm that they have reviewed the plans and compared these to the story poles in the field. And Vidos wonderfully pointed out with his exhibits that the shape of the proposed house follows the contours of the site and does not stick out of the landscape. The size of the proposed home is in keeping with existing development. The proposed house will not be particularly visible from below or down Ansonville Canyon Road. Uh, the proposed development cleans up a site that was abandoned following <coughs> debris removal of the prior burnout and instead will cover this unsightly disturbed area, as you could see on the pictures. And actually, our house improves, I think, the neighborhood character. We understand that this is house is not easy to rebuild and it will not be inexpensive. But since my wife and I left Germany more than 20 years ago, we did not want it easy. And since we decided to live and do business on three continents, we did not want it to be easy again. And since we decided to come to Malibu and plan this house, we certainly did not want it to be a boring one either. Uh, perhaps Malibu to be a special place should not be easy. The planning commissioners are appointed to be the guardians of the face, as we understand, of this Malibu. And the face of Malibu shall be a fair representation of the people who choose to live here. And we in our team work very hard over the last three and a half years to show that we understand what you want. And I think uh, now I would like to pass on to Talke and thank you for your consideration. Good evening, everyone. California is in my heart since I have worked for Larry Allison at Oracle. Roman and myself have both worked hard individually and together with our team to be where we are. We appreciate and value the Commission protecting and furthering the quality of life of all members of the Malibu community with their determinations. Therefore, we have been working on and asking for designing for a house which is in full harmony with the overall landscape. We understood from the beginning of the planning process that this house, once built, will not take its grandeur from the size it occupies, but rather its fitting with the earth tones of the canyons which are flowing towards the ocean. We purposely never planned and asked for a mega mansion because this is not what we stand for and this is not what we think Malibu stands for. Instead, we try to visualize who we are and what we intend to bring to Malibu by planning a house with character and a true representation of us. Hence, over the course of the last three and a half years, we took every advice from our planner, starting with Stephanie Dreckman Horner, Jessica Clevenger, Jessica Thompson, Acting Planning Director Richard Molika and previous Planning Director Bonnie Blue seriously, which led us to various remodels and redesigns. At last, we believe to have all thoughts addressed, everyone who sees the plans, whether neighbors, friends, family, or anyone who is else is delighted for all the right reasons. To address any potential concerns by individual commissioners, we can say that so far no objections of our plans have been made by any neighbor we have received letters of support from directly property neighbors, and we are addressing the MRCA letter to send to Chair Maza last week for offering our current footprint of mitigation strategy for potential endangered plant. We want to address the fact that our current footprint is centered around the previously built house and that the CDP for the burnout helped the previous owner to do extensive grading work for the rebuild. Our attention is to address the MRCA's concern to keep the conservation efforts on our land, which it greatly deserves now after the Hoosley fire and previously destroyed houses, that we can take care of a well-maintained house and fuel modification instead of leaving the loose rocks and sand potentially hurting neighbors and the public. We believe that everyone in our team deserves the house to be built as we envisaged and we thank you all very much for your consideration. Of course, we are open for questions and answers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, we're gonna close the public hearing and go back to the council table. Um, any comments or questions? Okay, I'll start it off with a question for Norm. Norm, could you come to the microphone? Yeah, I'm here, John. Okay, uh, 
you represent the three houses nearest to this property, right? At the end of Naranda? Well, one's a burnout and two of them, uh, one's under construction and the other one's been there for approximately 20 years. And you're, okay. that's correct. Do any of them have a pool and is in the pool on a slope? Uh, the house that's under construction has a fairly large pool that is on a very steep slope. Yes. Okay. Thanks a lot. Steve, you had some questions? Yeah, I got a, a, a couple. I mean, my takeaway when I looked at the house and, and looked at the plans was I'm not sure what the rules are anymore that we follow. I mean, we've got a situation here where we're building on one-to-one -one slopes, okay, which I didn't think we wanted to do. Uh, we are, there is no, this, this is a fire zone. I mean, of the house, I guess, to the north of it burnt down during the Woolsey Fire. Yet there is no buffer between just the 100 foot buffer for the ESHA is not included in this project. Uh, I went back and tried to find a well, foot buffer. Uh, I went back and tried to, uh, with Jessica to try to go back and find these other houses that have this example that uh, they're, they're building on one to one building pools on one to one slopes. I never got an answer for that. So it just seems to me that <clears throat> we've got to set a rule that we don't follow them. All right. I'll, anytime somebody wants to do something, we just say, we'll give you a variance and ignore all the, the rules that we've built in place to try and protect ourselves. And I just got a problem with that. I mean, I think, you know, the, the, the issue that says this house, you could not build a smaller house on this piece of property and avoid all these variances. I, I think that's an achievable objective, and I'm not sure why we don't do that. Okay, is that a statement or a question? Uh, if, if somebody can answer that question, I'm willing to listen to an answer, but it's, it's, it's as much a statement as a, as a question. I mean, why don't, when, when people come in and do this, and they've got all these variances, why don't we sit down with them in the beginning and say, you know, variances should not be handed out like chocolate chip cookies. There should be a real reason for doing that. And the fact that you want a 7,000 or 5,000, whatever size houses, I don't think is a reason to hand out a bunch of variances. They should be able to build inside the envelope that we have and, and, and minimize the number of variances that have to be issued. That's my perspective. Okay, other questions? I have a question to Jessica then. Um, Norm stated that there was, I think it was Norm, there was extensive previous grading on this property after it burned down. Have we ever determined how much grading was done at that time? And we, how did it affect the lot? <clears throat> um, I do not have the exact number of grading. Perhaps Vitas might be able to elaborate on that. I know the house was constructed um, previous to um, cityhood and he was unable to find the exact permits or grading specifications. He may have some more information on that. Um, Vitas, I don't know if you have that information. Uh, the site was graded to construct the first house. The grading took place in 1979 and it's pretty clearly depicted on that site. Uh, John, you had asked what grading took place after that point, after the first house was destroyed. And I believe the only grading that took place was to uh, construct a well by permit, and that's the well that you see when you first pull up to the lot, but also to remove the old foundations. And that's where the problem comes in. They busted out the old footings and hauled them away and left a lot of loose rock rubble that is rolling down or slowly sliding down that slope. And it's at the uh, east end of that southern slope that there's a problem that it could roll all the way down onto a neighboring property. And there's been no other grading. There's been no illegal grading between the first development and the way it sits today. That's how it was left when they cleaned up the site after the fire. This is back in, in uh, the 80s, right? It would be around 1985, yes, when they applied for a new coastal permit. Now, you gave us a map of, quote, adjacent properties, but they included a substantial number on Pacific Coast Highway which, uh, why did you do that since they aren't in a, a neighborhood, a neighborhood's defined as, you know, it has to have the same features. Um, were there just no other houses? There were no other houses. There's a neighborhood of those other three properties that Norm mentioned. But other than that, we needed to 
greatly expand our notification radius in order to get the requisite number of projects or properties to be notified of our plans to construct a house at 3620. So I stayed with those same neighbors that were being notified. I used them as the case studies for either pools on hillsides or for their square footages. So it's within the city limits, they're existing houses, and there are houses where the uh, county recorder's office or county uh, assessor's office has clear records of the square footage. And I took the closest 12 houses for square footage. I took everything within our notification radius. Uh, if it had a pool, I marked it. I think there are 21 pools. Okay, uh, either Jessica or Richard can answer this. It was my impression that if you didn't have 10 houses, within 500 feet, you notified to a thousand houses, a uh, thousand feet. Those, those houses, the other houses that he notified aren't really in the thousand foot zone, are they? All the houses that were notified were within, like Vetus was mentioning, because they weren't able to capture 10 developed properties within the 500 square foot radius, they had to expand the radius to a thousand square feet, and then within that a thousand square feet, they were able to capture twelve developed properties. But are you saying that PCH is more or less than a thousand feet from that house? I'll let me take a look at the radius and see the radius map and see what it captured. Okay. Yes, because there was also the question that Mark, I, I think. Mean, Chris Marks raised regarding the overhangs. Have you got an answer for that one? Yes. Um, so the project was not subject to two thirds because it is measures under 18 feet or at 18 feet in height. Additionally, you are correct that overhang is beyond six feet, but is perforated and open to the sky. So it was not calculated as part of the total development square footage. Okay. Um, but the, uh, the neighborhood standard doesn't apply in this case uh, a house on PCH versus a house on a cliff. Uh, was... It is it is a different neighbor. We are basing that um, the notification still has to be within that thousand square feet radius and I'm, I'm pulling up the map now um, okay. but well, while I pull that up. I'd be flabbergasted if that's a thousand feet but whatever it's that's not a huge deal. Um, now we I have never seen the Planning Commission, I don't know how long I've been on here, but quite a while, approve anything on a one-to-one -one slope. And we recently turned down a, a, a garage on a one-to-one -one slope. Um, how did the Planning Department determine that you can build on one-to-one -one slopes? Or is that just up to us? We just have to like, like to build on one-to-one -one slopes. Um, that is left at the discretion of uh, the Planning Commission to make these determinations and staff's analysis um, of the constraints of the site, um, including steep slopes and it having to be subject to hillside development standards. The project was subject to a very limited pad and forcing at least some of the house to be constructed on the steep slopes. The pool, I believe that's up to the commission to have some discretion on that, obviously. Um, but the house itself was so limited within the area, and that's how staff made that determination. Okay, now, uh, when I look at the slope analysis, the entire property on the, I guess, the north side is a one-to-one -one or more cliff. It says one-to-one -one or greater. And you look over the edge and uh, you, you wouldn't want to try to walk down it. Um, why isn't that considered a fire hazard since the house is built right up to the cliff? And there's no, there's no space at all. So fire goes uphill and there's not one inch on part of that pro property from the cliff. So how is this house going to be protected from the fire? The project was reviewed and approved by the fire department. Um, I believe that as well, Vitas can elaborate on any discussions you may have had with the fire department regarding um, safety measures that they have advised <clears throat> to take into place. Okay, Vitas, can I ask you, uh, fires come from the north and they go to the ocean or the west or whatever it is, or the east, and they go to the ocean. On, on the east side of your property, it looks like it's the east, there's no direction. You've got what looks like a couple hundred feet of cliff. 
uh, that's got ash on it. And heat goes up and flames go up when, when you light something on fire. What is in place to protect that house, especially on the pointy end of it, where it's actually built right up to the one-to-one -one slope? How is that house protected from, say, a 100-foot flame? A lot of this has to do with uh, what is a topography-driven fire. That's what you're describing there. And usually, oh. yeah, it's an offshore wind that brings us these dreadful fires. So it is going to come from the side, as you describe it. So what is important is that the house is not a type five house. This cannot be a wood framed house. It cannot have any glass that's unprotected. And most importantly, it cannot have any vented assemblies such as a vented roof assembly or a vented crawl space. It also cannot have any sort of waterproofing around the windows that contacts wood framing. You know, when you see the houses being built right now on Point Doom, they're all making this terrible mistake. They're putting the bitchethane right on the plywood. There's no way to save the house. That house will catch fire inside the wall before the fire gets there because the infrared that precedes the fire is going to cook that thing and start a fire in the wall. Our house will not have that. The infrared that comes from the fire is going to actually miss the house. The slope is so steep that the wind-driven fire headed towards the ocean is going to go right over that house. It needs oxygen and it needs something to burn. So the house is not threatened from the north. That fire goes over the house. It turns around three hours later. It comes from the south. That's the real danger to this house. And in fact, the brush clearance isn't even that critical. And this is why the fuel modification unit in Azusa is looking at these houses that we bring in when we guarantee we're going to do type one construction A or B. And we have a chimney on the south, but on the north, the topography is going to send the fire right over the house and we're not hanging over that slope. So yes, the house might be damaged, but we stand a really good chance of surviving that approach and less of a chance of surviving the side from the south, uh, the fire when it turns around. So this is considered, and that is actually a pretty good place to build. Now I tell you this, and we're looking at a site where the wood framed house that stood there before burned down. The house that stood there before was right where the fire is gonna touch ground again or come down the other south side of it, and it would be kindling, it's full of air, and it's got a vented assembly. That house was, you know, didn't stand a chance. The house we're proposing stands a pretty good chance and we've taken that into consideration. Um, when we discussed the house on Carbon Mesa, we did not feel that the fire department had made a very good decision in approving something less than 200 feet of clearance around the house. This project, I think, is another ideal project for only 100 feet of clearance, uh, but we did not pursue that because it's uh, not a popular way to do this, but there are no other wood structures around this. It's the wood structures that burn hotter than the brush and in this case, the chimney out of the north is actually going to send the fire over the house, and our threat comes from the south. And okay. John, I asked a similar question, and you might want to have Vita discuss the water tanks and uh, the other things they've done to mitigate fire issues. Okay, well, first, I'll, I will ask him that. Um, but Vita, I don't know if it's a drafting error, but on your color slope analysis, it looks like your eastern wall is directly on the edge of the cliff. It doesn't show any setback at all. Uh, how are you going to protect against that? Uh, it's a concrete retaining structure that's holding up the side of the hill. So the um, civil engineer on this project is showing all of the walls and all the concrete footings. The house doesn't actually go right to the edge of the house is set back a minimum of five feet. So the firefighters have a flat concrete walkway to get around the building but there is a wall right against the edge of the cliff that supports the firefighters' stairs to get around the building. But it's all concrete construction. There are no wood decks here. Are there any windows? Uh, there's lots of glass. They will all have to be steel shuttered. Okay, so you have to be there when the fire comes. There. You got Actually, they would deploy automatically. If the temperature reaches a certain point or there's enough infrared, those are gonna drop. If the power goes out, they close automatically. If you do still have power, you can close them from your cell phone. Okay, and now you talked about the fire department walk around. Um, how do you do that on the uh, on the less than two and a half to one slopes? Are you just not going to have it over on the on the pointy end of the house? No, you can actually walk around this entire house, and there are cantilevered concrete walkways and graded concrete walkways around the entire perimeter of the building. Now, they don't need to get into every floor, but they need to be able to access every major chamber in the house, and they can. 
Um, we'd have to flip around at different pages, but if you're looking at the color-coded slope analysis, it's pretty clear you can see those stairs that we have right next to the cliff. That entire northeastern flank of the building is accessible. And the lower walkways by the pool, those are rather clear. You can walk on those decks. It's concrete construction. Okay, and then uh, the pool is cantilevered over the uh, over the less than two and a half one slope. So it's just a concrete pool. It's got nothing that can burn. Is that right? That is correct. It doesn't require brush clearance. But the critical thing about this pool is that we need a six foot wall, sixty feet long down there. And that's one side of the pool. And it's, that's held up by pillars? Go ahead. That's held up by pillars? Yeah, that's going to have to be on shallow piles or a deepened foundation with a keyway. And we, we have the option of going in there and grading that material and getting it off the hill, but we're disturbing a much greater area. It's much simpler to go in there and build a footing next to it and support it and just set the pool on it. Okay, and then... Uh... Just continuing, the dotted area on the closest to the street. Yes. That's a another level of the building. Is that why it's dotted? Or that's dotted because it represents not necessarily the outer wall of the house, but rather the reach of the eave on that side of the house. The firefighters okay. don't walk under the eave. We're just showing where the eave sits. What picture are you on, John? I'm on the slope analysis. The last page in your set. It's 1124. Um, so there is an overhang on the site with the one-to-one -one slopes? Um, no, there's a concrete walkway. Yes, there is a projection there. There is. Correct. Okay, and what keeps that from burning? Well, it's going to be steel that's cantilevered out of the building, steel anchored in concrete. Oh, okay. Yeah, there's there's no wood in this house, John. Okie dokie. Now, uh, I'm going to go back to David's question, but I want to try to get most of mine done. Uh, we have an export. Uh, we have a, uh, a a grading analysis, but it doesn't cover underneath the house. How much dirt has to come out of this house and down the road when you get all done digging the hole for the basement and everything else, and lowering the house into the ground 20, 30 feet? Are we talking 100 truckloads, 500 truckloads? Um, if you go to sheet C3.0, that's where we have the total grading yardage verification certificate. It's fairly small, but it is legible. And um, the non-exempt grading for this project is around 400 cubic yards. That is to you know fix the site and get it ready for the house. That's what's outside of the building. But the, under the building, is around 2,600 cubic yards. So it's around 250 trucks that are going to go down that hill exporting this material. And they have to go over to the valley and dump? That is correct, yes. This is not a an inexpensive proposition. Okay, and that, so uh, that would be part of your management plan? You're going to be able to get those trucks down the hill without closing the road? That is indeed our plan, and uh, this cannot be done as a daisy chain of, of trucks going in and out. The rock needs to be broken up slowly. This is going to be a lengthy process, but I'm sure it can be accomplished without inconveniencing the neighbors unnecessarily and keeping the road open for emergency and everyone else. Yes, we can be loading those trucks and still get people in and out. We would not be loading all the trucks in a long line going up and down Miranda. The next truck would have to wait down on Ensenal. And we do have a nice flat area from which to load the trucks. It's where we propose to build the garage. The export of soil would be the first thing that happens. And the one good thing about this hard bedrock that we're dealing with is that the standing cuts actually stand up. We're cutting it out of silt and stand, sandstone. Uh, our goal, though, is to keep the boulders on site and export the sand. Okay, and as I understand it, this is a, a technically a one-story house? Indeed. There's, uh, the public areas are on the top level. Then the next level is cut into the face of the hill. Those are the bedrooms. And underneath the bedrooms is a garage and then two other larger chambers and a stairwell. But the two habitable spaces on top, they do not stack. The bedrooms are forward under a deck in front of the top level. So there's an upper single story, and then there's a lower single story, and there's a basement underneath that lower single story. Okay. Um, you 
chose to have a one-story house instead of a two-story house, which I assume means that you needed a, a bigger pad uh, and a variance for uh, setbacks. Why did you choose to go for a variance versus having a two-story house? Well, we were looking at this as a secondary ridge line. Certainly as hillside construction, we felt it was best to keep the house under 18 feet in height. So we managed to do that by not building a second story up on top. If we build two stories up there, we're rather quickly over 18 feet at the southern exposure of the building. Yeah, but that would. my question is, wouldn't that allow you not to have all these variances and, and put the house right up next to the one-to-one -one slope? We'll take a look at the variances and the minor modification. One of them is for construction ESHA. The entire site, even though disturbed, is mapped as ESHA. We have no choice. It's not something special that we're asking for. So even the smallest two-story house would require that variance. Our minor, minor modification is to keep the house closer to Naranda and away from the material on the other side, from the ESHA that we're trying to protect. And lastly, we have you know that construction on slopes. Something needs to be done down there. We need to build a retaining wall to hold this loose rubble that is migrating down the hill at the southeast corner. Okay, uh, David, I took so much time I forgot your question. So can you ask it? Well, it was, it was a question I asked that related to one of your points about fire uh, mitigation, and it has to do with the, the number of water storage and uh, tanks that are spread throughout this property, which I asked about when I had my conversation with them. And if you want more fire information, Vitas can tell you what he told me. Okay, the uh, question on that is, these are underground tanks. Uh, and this is out in the middle of nowhere, basically. Uh, what provision do you have for pumping the water out of those tanks if you lose power? Uh, the, there are two tanks proposed. This is well water. There's a 25,000 gallon tank that has a non-electric reed on it. So when the fire department pulls up to the site, they can immediately see that. They'd be able to use a pumper truck to extract water, but we have enough fall. That we have a draft hydrant below those 25,000 gallons. That's potable water going to the house. So water is circulated through that tank on a daily basis. There's an additional 5,000 gallon tank that's just for the irrigation system. There too, the water migrates through the tanks. So they don't get stale water when they pull up. They have two separate hydrants that are just downhill from the house. We don't need a pump. And similarly, the swimming pool provides another 30,000 gallons that is on its own separate draft hydrant and would be labeled as such. Uh, it's very clear that it's pool water if you've seen one of those signs. So we are providing 60,000 gallons of water right as you drive up to the house before you reach the house and you would not need to have a pump. Okay, anybody else have questions? Uh, Steve, yes, I see your hand. Oh, Jeff I'm sorry, was David first? Before me, so you would... Well, wait, Jeff, Jeff was ahead of me, so go ahead, okay, Jeff. Okay, Jeff, I, I can't. Uh, I was just, I, I would ask you, Venus, about, <coughs> um, uh, about the fire department situation, because you've got a, a, a will not serve letter here, and what I had always heard about properties in this area is that if, if uh, one water district or another wasn't willing to serve, that the fire department wouldn't approve it. But you apparently have turned that around. You just sort of enlighten me as to, to what it was about the project that allowed the fire department to approve it without a, a will serve letter? Well, they looked at the actual project, the type of structure, that it was type 1A construction that we're proposing, and the amount of water that we're providing on site, and that we have the topography to make that water in our tanks readily available to their trucks. And they felt that the quantity of water was adequate and that the topography actually worked in our favor to some degree. And they were pleased with the uh, firefighter access and walk around. Uh, they felt it's actually better in terms of protecting the homes in that immediate neighborhood. Those would be the ones behind the gates, not the ones that we show going down Ensemble to PCH, but that the ones immediately there behind the gate would benefit from the presence of those 60,000 gallons of water and a building that's essentially non-combustible, and that that site is cleaned up, that all appeal to them. They will have a proper hammerhead outside those gates. So, so it, let me, it, let me, process. I appreciate your answer. Let me ask you a different subject, uh, on a different subject. The the, the rock debris that, that, that um, is downhill that you feel needs to be stabilized. But uh, short of building a um, 
the retaining wall down there. What other methods are there to deal with with uh, the the potential danger of a rock fall from from uh, those boulders? This would require digging up that hump of material that's been allowed to slide down the hill there. It has sort of stabilized itself in one location, but we'd have to go cut a road below it and then bring that material out of there. As it sits right now, we're proposing to go down there and dig footings and put a retaining wall just below the material. But we can also go in and cut a road from below and export all that material as well. It's limiting the export and it's dealing with surface materials that are loose that are no longer in the site where mother nature put them. These are materials that were busted free when they pulled out those foundations and someone let them just go down the hill and settle 12, 15 feet below the uh, remnant pad from the old house. And they're in the, the area where they're likely to roll down. The other, the big boulders that you see in our photos, they're actually quite stable. And we propose to keep them in place and pin them. But this other material is loose, small rubble. We can't pin it and it's quite a mass and we'd have to export it. It's spread uniformly. It's not in one tall stack. It's a big area we'd have to clean. Well, that would be the option um, to building the retaining wall. Correct. It's either grading that out and exporting it or building a, a wall that's less than six feet tall, but about 60 feet long. Okay, thank you. Adrian, hey, did you have another before I go? Yeah, I, it, it, it's more just a statement of my sort of confusion about this project than it is a question. I. Uh, you know, I am in awe of the architectural design. It's the most, you know, dramatic, uh, I, I think, you know, beautiful. If, if you're going to live on a promontory and we're going to allow these kind of things in Malibu, um, you know, it's, it's just, it's quite spectacular. Uh, like John, I, I get uh, uncomfortable in heights and I, I couldn't do it and I couldn't go up that road. But it seems like, you know, the city has a lot of obstacles for you all to satisfy. And, um, you know, there's no end to the, there's the Esha, there's the front yard setback, there's the steep slopes, there's the taking away the construction materials. There's, as Jeff was just talking about that wall and, you know, you're, you're kind of doing it to each one of them. I mean, the cumulative effect is kind of, wow, that's a lot to have to deal with, but you seem to be dealing with it. So I'm, I'm just very confused about what, you know, how, how this should go, because uh, there are a lot of, gee, that looks like a problem, and you seem to have pretty good answers to almost all of them. So I'm just sort of sharing my angst with the group. Steve? Okay, good angst, David. Vitas, uh, the last time there was a fire, the Woolsey fire, did the, did the fire department go up to, to protect some of those houses? Or did they use some other method to try and put out fires? I believe they came in after the fires had passed over the Naranda Hillock and that there was some, uh, you know, FOS check being dropped in certain areas that may have saved one or two of those houses. Most of those houses burned because they were left unattended and they weren't engineered to be left unattended. Those the fire department came up that hill and up in front of those houses that were right next to where you're building. They did not. No, that area was left to fend for itself. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and that's part, look, that's part, you know, we're spending all this time talking about fire protection in Malibu, right? I mean, we're going, you know, we've got people doing site visits and all the rest of the stuff. And some of the rules that we were applying every place else, you know, harden your house, build a, a defensible space around it. We're ignoring in this house. You're supposed to be a hundred foot setback from the Esha. We don't have that. What, Jeff? Don't shake. That's that's what we're. Well, the, the, that, that's a different issue. That's a, it, that, that has not to do with fire safety. It, it's the fact that you haven't, you you can't have but a ten thousand square foot pad without in, in the Esha area, and and. The, so you think building right next to the edge of the Esha is a good idea? No, I'm saying it's a question of what you can do with a piece of property. The whole thing is that. I, I understand what you can do. With, I'm just saying, do you think it is a good idea for people to build houses right next to the Esha and ignore that setback? It, well, from a fire that, perspective. It, 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 if, if your question is, do I think it should be prohibited? No. I said it's prohibited. I said, you think it's a good idea. You think, based upon all- Would I build learned, my house there? No, but-, but, after, we, but after we've, all the stuff we've learned about fires, okay? 
where it, you know, they come up the side of the hill, they have God knows how much heat going in there. And we're saying, let's ignore what we've learned and do something different here. And I don't understand why we're doing that. That's Steve, just- I'd like to comment on that. There is nothing that I know of in the code that when they established the 10 foot development pad, there's nothing in the code that says you cannot clear for ASHA for fire protection. Okay. In fact, it's as far as I'm concerned, it's required. Um, I just remember, Mikey, we had a, a house on the beach that we approved that Mikey Pearson grew up in. And it was a, I believe it was a Thornton Able house. It was 100% steel and concrete. And he testified that it exploded in a fire. It literally exploded. The windows blew out, the roof caved in because of the heat. Um, so I'm, I'm very, very concerned. We're building a, a house on a cliff in a fire zone. Um, and I'm also very concerned that we're allowing building on one-to-one slopes. We've never done that in Malibu that I know of. Um, That's the issue. And, and part of the reason we're considering that is, oh, there's swimming pools in the area, but there's one other pool, one other pool within a thousand feet. So that's not a precedent, okay? Um, and this is on a one-to-one. So I, I, I understand that this is a cool house. It's like looking at the movie Zabriskie Point. It's a cool house. Uh, but we saw a picture, the first picture Vita showed was a 1,400-square-foot house on that pad, and it had tons of land around it, okay? So... That doesn't mean to me you can't build a house pretty close to this size by moving it back to where it should, you know, giving a front yard variance and placing it away from known dangers. I mean, there is no question if a fire came up that hill, you would want to be within a mile of there, okay? And this idea that you can push a button and your house becomes totally non-burnable theoretically might be sold by some company that makes shutters, but it doesn't happen. Things melt. I've seen houses melt here. Uh, so I'm very concerned about that. I, I see that they're cooperating with what Norm wanted, but we're talking a road that no fireman will ever go up. We know that. Uh, we have no well served letter built on a cliff, dug into the ground with what was it, 2,600 trucks or something, uh, taking the dirt out because it's going to be underground on a one of the smallest pads around. Granted, it burned down 35 years ago. So the CDP, there's no grandfathering there. But this property can be built on. It's the question is, can it be built safely in a size that is adequate or more than adequate, um, but doesn't encroach on one-to-ones and less than two-and-a-half-to-ones and right up next to the edge. Uh, it's way beyond what we've ever approved, approved before. We've yeah. never approved, unless the planning director corrects me, a one-to-one building. Never done. One, one favor, uh, if I could ask a question of Patrick. Can you just, again, give guidance on what should be um, the thoughts that we consider when looking to consider a variance? Again, what, what's kind of the, the language we should have in mind? Just if you could paraphrase. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, it, it depends on, on which variance you, you, you're discussing, the, the, the staff report. In general, list. in general, just in general, considering variances. Uh, you, I guess that's kind of hard for me to, without knowing specific which one. I mean, but, you know, the, the variance is the way that I, I always, the two things that pop into my mind are special circumstances or exceptional circumstances. So to the extent that, you know, once again, I, I, I would caution you to rely upon that. Rather, I would go to the findings as articulated in the staff report. But those are the, the, those are the things that always pop into my mind, that what is special about this property that would mandate the variance. Got it. Thank not you. mandate, excuse me, but that, that, would, that would rather allow the allow. planning commission to make it. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Can I ask the property or the size of the house? Yeah. Yeah, but Patrick, I want to ask you a question. Variances that are at our discretion, aren't they? Absolutely. And and they take in a lot more factors than 
normal. For example, there's public health and safety findings in the general plan and the LCP. There's, there's, uh, uh, and we are not required to to allow a house to be the maximum size on the table. Okay, it's that is the maximum we can approve, not the minimum. Um, so uh, let me see. Uh, there's something I just found here. Uh, yes, it's one of the things that bothers me is in the uh, in the LCP land use plan 6.9. It talks about minimizing grading and uh, cut and fill operations and ensuring that graded slopes blend with existing terrain and all kinds of stuff about th there's, in other words, what I'm trying to ask is, it's not as simple as just saying, oh, this one finding in these three, three or four uh, 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 determinations. There's a lot of other things we can take into consideration. And one of them is health and safety, isn't it? I, I would, I would caution a blanket yes to that. I mean, yes, there are, I guess, the other, you know, yes, the, the planning commission is not just specifically to the language that, you know, the findings are what they are, but to the extent that other aspects of the, of the, of the code or the, or, or the LCP play into that, that, you know, the, 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 the coastal, the, the commission can rely upon, you know, that, that, that guidance and, and direction. I would, I would, I would caution just, you know, Denying very or denying variances not based off of, off of the findings required, but entirely on on something different that can play into the analysis and kind of inform the analysis, et cetera. But 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 I, I would not deny a variance based off of a different section without at least some nexus to the to the required findings. If that makes sense. We have we have to make a finding that this project as a whole follows the general plan, the LCP, and the Malibu Municipal Code. Yes, we have to make that finding. So if it doesn't, we can't make that finding. So the whole thing's dead. Oh. John, you're confusing the general findings with the variance findings. The, the, the variance findings are laid out in your staff report. They're the, the, the eight, nine findings, ten findings that you have to make. I and, understand that. And and so the, so what we're talking about here. Is it really the one the one finding we're talking about that's critical? It's the one whether we're to allow building on a one to one slope, and that's a, that's a, a difficult proposition, and it's difficult for me because because a, I don't see I'm having trouble finding that there's been a real strong showing that denying the the variance would uh, deprive the applicant of, of uh, privileges that have been enjoyed by others in the area. Uh, I. I, I know that there are a lot of pools in the area, but that's not the issue. The issue is whether there are other areas, uh, pools built on a one-to-one -one slope or anything built on a one-to-one -one slope for that matter. And I'm having trouble finding that uh, in the record. On the other hand, um, one of the aspects of it that, that, that seems kind of relevant to me is that, is that if you deny this project, uh, deny the, the, the variance on the project, the, pro the house will still be built it will be built in a different fashion. It'll be a fashion that avoids construction on the one-to-one -one slope. And in that event, that's why I asked the question to Vetus as to what the alternatives are. In the event, there will have to be a, a road cut down there below that rubble and all that extra material will have to be removed. Now, it seems to me that that the solution that Vetus has proposed to come up with is probably the better solution, but that doesn't get him where he needs to go because even if it's the better solution, you still have to be able to make the findings for the variance. And those findings still require the whole privilege, special privilege uh, argument. So it's difficult, it's a very difficult position uh, for him to be in, it seems to me, um, even though I think his solution is probably the better engineering solution. But keep in mind, I mean, you know, that, 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 that even though it's a, it's a fire prone area, Remove the variance, and he's still going to come back and still going to build a house there. And it's not going to have, you know, it, it'll probably be designed the same way with the same steel and the same shutters and all the rest of it. And you may not like that. You may not think that's a great idea from a fire safety point of view, but that's what the code allows. So um, that's my take. 
Well, my take, and I, and I, and I, I, this is a nice house. I just think that it's pushed to the edge, and I, I can't make the finding that you can build a one-to-one slope, especially a swimming pool, uh, and part of the house, and et cetera. Uh, I also have a health and safety problem with building a house on the edge of a cliff, and this is a cliff, okay? I, I think it should be set back a little. Five, 10 feet makes, makes a difference, okay? We've had, we've had uh, houses where we required uh, firewalls to break up the fire coming up the cliff. Now, I don't know if you could build anything on that cliff. I wouldn't want right, to fell down it. But that's not in front of us now. What, we, what, what it sounds like to me is, is that there's, there's, what we can do is decide whether we're going to grant the variance or not. And, the, and I don't think that there's, I don't personally find an issue with regard to the variance regarding uh, 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 building an Esha. Uh, I think that the, the 10,000 square feet uh, minimum pad takes care of that problem. But uh, I do have a problem with the with the slopes uh, steeper than two and a half to one variance. Um, and that was my initial reaction when I read the staff report was, gee, looks like you could pull that house back toward the street a bit and get rid of that of that swimming pool. And it's only by hearing Peterson's explanation of why that's the better engineering solution that makes me um, uh, kind of casting about to see if I can't find a, a, an argument to allow the variance, but I'm having trouble doing that even so. Okay. Well, uh, okay. yes, I, I can't see you. So, uh, me, John, we are, whoever's speaking. Oh, there you go, Steve. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to vote against the house for basically this, the reason that you know, Jeff brought up that said that you're building on one to one slopes. Uh, and, and there's, there, I asked, I mean, that was one of the questions I asked prior to coming into the meeting was, give me the addresses of the places where somebody else has built a pool on one-to-one -one slopes and I didn't get any. So, I mean, it's, it's real hard to figure out what we're depriving this guy of that somebody else has gotten. I've also got a concern with the fact that in the last fire, the fire department did not come up the hill. They, they weren't up there. All right, what they did that they try to put the fire on as best I can I've, I've learned using water drops or FOS check jobs, whatever the heck they were doing. So having all these pools is really nice and having the, the ability for the fire department to pump them out is good, except if the fire department doesn't come up there, they ain't going to do a hell of a lot of good. So I do have a concern with the process of not having the 100 foot setback from the from the ESHA. Uh, and so those are the two main reasons I'm going to vote no on this house. Um, well, I, let me go. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, I did have one other question. I think uh, to uh, uh, Director Bamalika. Sorry, um, just uh, on that setback from Esha. Um, what, like, is there any footprint? There's th this is all in Esha, so there's no footprint where they could build 200 feet away. So there's got to be some variance on that metric, correct? That's correct. I think it, that as the, I'm hearing from the commission this evening, and we may want to ask the applicant this, I agree. I don't think there's any way that they could avoid the uh, ESHA setback, even if you built very close to, the, I mean, let's just say on the street. Uh, from what I recall in the ESHA maps, that's still not going to give you the distance you need. So I think they're limited to uh, the, the 10,000 square foot development area. Um, but it, it's kind of sounding like where the commission would like to go with this is perhaps we ask the applicant if uh, they're willing to perhaps try to find either a smaller design that, uh, as Commissioner Jennings brought up, that pulls it off of the steep slopes and more towards the street, um, or perhaps they want to come back with additional information that justifies that there's not a uh, benefit being given to them, but it sounds more like the commission's requesting that they they scale back the development a bit. Well, yeah, let, go let ahead. Me, Chris, let me just so we don't drag this on forever. Um, Vetus, uh, are you? Can you un unmic Vetus? Um, can you hear me? Yes, I can, John. Okay, uh, as Jeff says, he can count, and I think you can count. Um, we always offer, we try to offer the applicant the chance to continue the hearing to a date uncertain to try to fix what the real concerns are uh, rather than vote a project down and start all over again. Is this something you want to consider or should we go ahead and take a vote? 
I have to leave that up to the owners of the property. Mm -hmm. I'm in favor of a quick redesign on this thing and reduction in the size of the building and just proposing a wall down on the one-to-one -one slope instead of a swimming pool. Well, do you want to uh, take five minutes and confirm with them or? or... Uh, can we just turn on the, the microphone for Roman and Tuka and see what they would like to do at this point? Oh, uh, if you want to do it in public, fine. Otherwise, we'll give you five minutes to do it in private. Uh, let's do it in public. Okay. Can you turn on their mics, please? Um, I think it is very difficult to address all the points which you made because uh, from our understanding, the pool is necessary as a retaining wall for the uh, protection from um, rock fall, uh, landslide, from the uh, material what you have seen when you visited the site. Uh, that it is very porous and and a very loose dirt. Um, you mentioned that we would have the plan to be extended to the maximum size what is possible. Um, I, I think if you compare it to the 12 houses, we are 12,000 square feet below the average. So this is what we could we could see this as a rather small house and not a large house. But I understand your concerns with regards to the variances. Um, I don't know how we technically can get around these variances. And I, I, would, I, I would tend to have this discussion first with Vidos, if you would give us five minutes in private uh, to check this out, what what his ideas are, how we could how we could address your concerns better. Okay, uh, let's let's uh, uh, close the meeting for well until uh, twenty minutes of ten, which is uh, nine minutes from now, and uh, we'll come back and see what you what you would like to do, and then we'll continue the meeting. Thank you. Okay. 940, right? 940.
Richard, for some reason, I don't see everybody. So when everybody gets here, will you let me know? Certainly. Oh, there we go. Alex has changed our view. Okay. Do you see them now? I see four of them, but that's okay. I just... We're all here. Uh, everybody's Jennings here? is not. Jennings is now. Okay. Yeah, so everybody's here. Okay. Uh, I'm reconvening the uh, regular planning commission meeting dated November 16th, uh, considering item 5D, continuing hearing. Okay. We have uh, Vetus. Can you give us an idea of what your thoughts are? I have discussed the project with Roman and Tauke, and it feels as though we're going back to the house as we originally submitted it, with a swimming pool on the upper level, not below the house, and removing the loose rubble that is sliding down the hill towards that corner. So the footprint of the grading will be larger, and it will be a proper two-story house, and that part of the upper level overlaps the lower level. Okay, well, Vitas, yeah. uh, we don't need to know what you're going to do because you can come back and tell us. So are you saying you want to have a continuance to a date uncertain or do you want, you want a date certain? We want to have a continuance. We're going to come back uh, with the model that we've already presented to planning. And that's, that's a date uncertain? Uh, we can have it ready very soon if we can get an earlier date, yes. That... Richard, what, what is the situation? I know the 12th. But the next meeting has got a whole bunch of stuff. Um, the only concern I have is uh, is without the design in front of me, uh, Vetus, is that over 18 feet in height? No, it measures 18 feet above existing or finished grade throughout the entire building. However, there is an area where the downstairs tucks underneath the upstairs on that one, and the pool is sucked back into the building. And from what I understood, they were not happy with the fact that part of the building was two-story. And this is why we dragged it out and had to spread the footprint. Got it. Okay. Um, I'm going to suggest we, we continue it to a date uncertain and, and let yeah. the plans get firmed up and let Richard schedule it among the, all the many things that we have to look at over the next couple Okay. Of is that a motion? That would be a motion, yes. I, I, I just, I, I have one other just thought I did want to throw out there, especially since this would come to a two thirds rule. Um, those on those, um, those covers, the way they kind of cut the holes out in the middle, they still have like a four to six foot wide kind of perimeter around that. I would ask that those narrow up because otherwise it's like you got these additional covered spaces. That's one other just concern I had in looking at this design, okay. if we're going to have that's, a continuum. That's informative only, though. We can't tell. Yeah, no, I understood. I just want to, one concern I had as I was looking at this. Hey, do you have a second? I'll second Jeff's motion. Okay. Whoever made the motion, uh, second. Any discussion? Okay, let's take a vote. Commissioner Jennings? Yes. Commissioner Uring? Yes. Commissioner Weil? Yes. Vice Chair Marks? Yes. Chair Mazza? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, we're on to item number 8A, and that's the calendar for the Planning Commission meeting. I don't think we need a staff report since it's a one-page report. Does anybody have any discussion? Okay, I will make a motion to accept, adopt 2021 calendar for Planning Commission meetings. Second it. Now, uh, let's take a vote. Chair Maza? Yes. Commissioner Jennings? Yes. Commissioner Weil? Yes. Commissioner Uring? Yeah, I think yes, but I think you should have more meetings. <laughs> <laughs> Vice Chair Marks? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, do we have a motion to adjourn? I move to adjourn. I'll second that. We're out of here. And it's in the name of, uh, in honor of Kim Tipper. Yeah. Hey, have a nice evening. All right, guys. Adios. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. I know I saw Robert Gold here. Um, had anybody considered the fact that leaving the fence there was okay for some of us because of...
there's already adequate watering because I was there today and I saw that you did need a fence and you did need a green wall.